following announcement has been paid for by the WZWA Network. Hey everybody, this is the Rage and Cajun, Lash LaRue, and you are watching the Insider's Edge of Podcast. Hi, everybody. This is former WWE superstar Al Snow. And T.W. Anderson. Sean Oliver. My name is Eugene. And you are watching the Insider's Edge podcast. Now get on the train. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Insider's Edge podcast here on the WZWA Network in conjunction with Blue Wire Hustle. I'm your host with the most on the West Coast, California in Fury. It is so good to be here tonight. I am so excited because I got another guy off my bucket list right here, right now. It means the world to me to be able to have the opportunity right now to introduce to you all former WCW World Tag Team Champion champion cartoonist extraordinaire the one and only incomparable raging cajun lash larue how are you bro man i'm phenomenal you got it it's me it's me it's that old rc it's the raging cajun a lash larue and it's wonderful to be with you carl i appreciate you and having interest and wanting to take some time to speak to me about my career Absolutely, bro. I'm thrilled and, and it means the world to me to have you on the show. I'm ready to put you up on that pedestal that you deserve to be. And the first question, Lash, that I ask everybody is how did you become a wrestling fan? A wrestling fan? The way I became a wrestling fan is I actually had a stepdad when I was about six years old that was a big wrestling fan. And he watched it, the old Georgia Championship Wrestling and the old NWA back in the day. And Continental Championship Wrestling, which was based out of Alabama and uh, sort of had the Armstrongs uh, and the Fullers. And they were really the stable that that kind of made all that happen and made all that work. Dr. Tom Pritchard was a part of that at the time, as a matter of fact. And they were based in Pensacola, I think. And that territory went from Pensacola all the way up to, to Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, uh I fell in love with wrestling watching that. And then like all kids, I'd get out there. I had two brothers, an older brother and a younger brother, and I'm the runt. And so we would just go out and we'd have wrestling matches on the trampoline and throw each other around and, man, thought I was Hulk Hogan. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? Like uh, there's a certain charm to it when you're a, a young man or a young girl watching wrestling. You're a fan of it, but it's also a tutorial and a way of how to torture your siblings as well. Sure, absolutely, man. <laughs> the other thing that's phenomenal uh, to me is such a strange, enigmatic aspect of the wrestling business is I can remember being of that generation, exactly what you're talking about, Carl. You go out there and you're wrestling with your friends, you're wrestling with your siblings, you're putting them in all these holds, and you're working a match, you don't even realize you're working a match, right? And what I mean by that is you're not trying to hurt one another. And, and then I can remember in the late 90s, there was this spat here in the United States where a lot of kids were getting really injured to the point of death of doing these moves on one another. And I was asked once in an interview, do we take any responsibility for that as wrestlers? And I'm like, look, at, here's, here's my perspective on that. I can remember being a kid and doing these moves and not wanting to hurt the other person, even though I thought wrestling was real. Because I love that person or it was a friend, you know, and now we're telling them that wrestling is entertainment and they're going out and trying to really do the moves on one another. That's not a good thing. you know. No, definitely not. Me and my friends, we did it on trampolines and mattresses when we were 12, 11, 12 years yeah. old, you know, so and, and, uh, and I'm sure that when we went to hit a move on each other, we would place each other down. We wouldn't be uh, slamming them down onto uh, a wooden or, or a concrete floor. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, when was it, uh, you know, obviously the years go by, you go through high school, there's got to be a point in time where you think to yourself, you know what? I really, this is something that I really want to do. You know, it's funny, but it was really by happenstance for me. It was on a whim, man. And I never would have thought it'd been such an important part of my life because to, if you want to do the deep dive on who is last group, I grew up extremely poor. Um, yeah. We lived in some houses. We didn't have running water or electricity just because we couldn't afford the bills. And my mom raised five kids and she quit school in the eighth grade. You know, uh, we just never had much money. So I started working at a very young age. I started working 
when I was about nine years old. And fast forward without getting into a lot of personal uh, aspects of that, by the time I was a junior or senior year, in high school, I was homeless. And so I was working at night at a clothing store, sleeping on the floor behind the cash register. I'd get up at five o'clock in the morning. I'd go to school. I played football at school so I could take a shower in the athletics department. I'd have my classes all day. After school, I'd have football practice or wrestling practice because I wrestled amateurly as well. And then I'd go home with a buddy that I played football with, uh, eat with his family, take a shower, go back up there and sleep on the floor again. And that was kind of my junior, senior year of high school. And when I started college, uh, and I mentioned that, by the way, because that kept me, I was so busy, it kept me from being able to watch wrestling. So I had about a uh, six-year period probably there where I kind of fallen away from the sport and not really paid attention to it. And then about 95 is when I graduated high school. 96, 97, I started college. And uh, suddenly things had settled down for me a little bit. I was making my own life for myself, and I had a little more time on my hands. And I started watching wrestling on Monday night. WCW had not started Nitro for very long by that point. Uh, the NWO had just come out and, and made their debut. Hogan had just made his big evil heel turn. <laughs> and uh, business was big in the Atlanta-based WCW. And I saw a commercial for the power plant. And WCW caught my eye because all the guys I grew up watching seemed to be a part of that company at the time. You had Ric Flair. You had Sting. You had the Macho Man. You had... Roddy Piper, you had Hulk Hogan, you had the Ultimate Warrior, and now Hall and Nash out there as well, Lex Luger. So all these guys that I remember from my childhood, that pulled me in. And then the other guys that we mentioned at the beginning, uh, the work rate and the wrestling ability of guys like Rey Mysterio and Juventud and Chavo Guerrero and Eddie Guerrero and, and Hugh Morris and those guys that were kind of on the other card, Chris Jericho, that caught my eye. So I was hooked at that point, and I probably was not back being a wrestling fan and watching it for maybe a month before I called the power plant and set up a tryout. And uh, and I went to a three-day tryout at the WCW power plant, thinking to myself, I'm never going to make it. Um, I'm not going to be big enough. I'm not going to be athletic enough because I was never a standout athlete. And uh, But I thought – I'll have this great story to tell all my buddies, right? Maybe I'll meet Hogan and shake his hand or meet Ric Flair or meet Sting. I was naive. I didn't know what to expect. And uh, I, I went there, and that was a whole other experience. But suffice to say that it came natural to me. And for whatever reason, that seemed to be a door that God opened for me, and, and I was able to make the most out of it. Wow, what a whirlwind right there. I can't believe that I never knew any of that about you. And I'm so proud of you for getting yourself out of that situation and getting to, you know, the place that you ended up getting to where you were able to be comfortable enough to go for an opportunity like this. So that is just an incredible story. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. Um, You've mentioned the WCW Power Plant. We've had many guys on the show that have told about their experiences there. Uh, Alan Funk in particular said that it was probably the hardest thing he's done in his life. And there were people that were ex-Marines and stuff like that that couldn't even get through the tryout. So the fact that you could get through the tryout, that itself is an incredible story. Please tell me a little bit about the experience there. And, uh, you know, who were some of the guys maybe you clicked with at the power plant when you first got there? Well, that, that's the secret sauce right there. What you just mentioned is the secret sauce because it was all about heart. It was all about dedication. It was guys like an Alan Funk, for instance. Uh, when I came through the power plant, there were a couple of guys that had already been there or been through it or were training there even if that wasn't their start. And what I mean by training there is uh, you had guys like Glacier and, and Chris Canyon and Disco Inferno and even Billy Kidman sometimes. And these were Atlanta-based guys that would come and, and just train. And I was able to meet them. In fact, the first, if you wanted to call it a match, even though there was no audience involved, uh, I had not been there maybe a week and Chris Canyon was there. And Chris uh, pulled me in the ring with him and said, let's have a match. And, man, I, I barely knew how to lock up with that one. But he led me through it and I learned a lot in moving around the ring with somebody that knew what they were doing. Uh, the same token, right after me, right after me, uh, Alan Funk was not too long after me. Uh, 
trying out, becoming a part of that fold. Same thing with Mike Sanders, Elix Skipper, uh, some of those guys coming through. Those are the ones that jump in off the top of my head. Every Courageous, I think, had already come through at that point. Uh, yeah. But for me, my experience was this. I went to the I went to that three-day tryout not knowing what to expect, and I got there, and there were 22 guys, 24 guys in my tryout class, and a lot of them were exactly what you said. They were ex-military guys. There were guys that were college football players that washed out of the NFL or didn't make it to the NFL. There were bodybuilders. There were other professional athletes. And mostly it was just guys that showed up thinking, if I have the look and I impress them, mm -hmm. they're going to want to hire me and want me to be the next Goldberg or the next big star, right? And uh, Goldberg had just come through at that point too. And so uh, these guys, I, I get there and I'm looking around and, man, and everybody is – you know, 6'4", 6'5", 290 pounds, abs, just shredded, look, looking great. And then Sarge walks in. And Sarge was just this notorious drill sergeant guy that was just a fire plug of a, of a former Coast Guard, you know, military guy. And he'd come in and all he would say, he'd drop the bag and say, grab a bucket. And they had these five-gallon buckets in the corner that you flipped over and you just did squats off of. Man, you did squats until you puked, and then you jumped down on your stomach, did push-ups, flipped over, did sit-ups. You got up, you ran into place, and then you started doing squats. And that didn't stop, man. That didn't stop from 8 o'clock until 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, you got a water break. Then it started back up again after about a five-minute water break, and you did that until lunch. Lunch, you went out, you ate lunch, and then you went out and you ran wind sprints in the parking lot. You came back in, and you started doing all those again until 5 o'clock in the evening. And that was day one. So by the end of the first day, maybe eight guys had dropped out. And I'm looking around. Mostly it would happen when you're doing the squats. Uh, guys' legs would lock up. They'd cramp. They just couldn't do it. They'd collapse under the weight of it. And I'm looking around and I'm seeing people drop. And it took me till about the end of the first day to go, oh, this is a heart check. Like I said, Carl, by that point, I've been through stuff in my life. You know what I mean? I I experienced some hard times and my back had been against the wall and I had to fight for everything that I had. And I said, if this is a heart check and this is about who wants it the most, then I've got the advantage regardless of what I look like. I'm not going to quit. You may ask me to leave. You might run me off. But I'm not going to quit. And these other guys, man, their mentality that they were just going to show up and have a job. WCW took the position. You called us. We didn't call you. We got plenty of guys on the roster. And if you can't do it, go home. If you want to quit, then quit. And that was Sarge's take on it. And it was like a military boot camp. I mean, an in-your-face, snarling, spitting. It, can you do it or can't you do it? Do you want to go home? Do you want to, you know, that kind of stuff. And that just wasn't going to rock me. It wasn't going to rattle me psychologically. So by the end of the first day, there were maybe 16 guys left. The next morning, which was a Thursday, it was always a three-day tryout, like a Wednesday, Thursday, and a Friday. But next morning, we showed up, and I think there was a dozen of us or eight of us. Uh, by the end of that day, there was maybe six left, four left. By Friday, me and one other guy showed up. Oh my and gosh. You started off. Oh, yeah. You started off the first couple of hours doing the exact same stuff again, and then they put you in a ring and let you run the ropes and let you take a few bumps just to see if you were athletic enough to learn how to wrestle. And by lunchtime, they were they were done with the actual tryout aspect of it, the physical aspects of it, and then they brought you into an office and uh, set you down. You sat down with Jody Hamilton and with Sarge and the other trainers at the time that were there were Mike Winter and Pistol Fez Watley. And their take was, their position was, we're not guaranteeing you a job. We're not telling you you will ever wrestle for WCW. We don't promise a contract. We're not saying you can be on TV if you just keep hanging with this thing. What we promise you is you can pay us three grand and we'll train you to be a wrestler. <laughs> and right. my mentality was, I really think that this is going to come natural to me. If I think that I have any kind of aptitude for it, you pay for any training that you get in this world, right? For any occupation at all. And this was like the Harvard of professional wrestling. So if I was going to have a chance at this anywhere, then it was going to be here. This was probably my best shot. And my mentality in life in general has always been shoot for the moon. And if I fall a little short, I'm going to be far better off than I was otherwise. So, 
um, I paid, I had about half of that money saved up and I paid half of it. the other half. I'd work off by going to CNN center and moving furniture around in the offices and things like that. I drove back and forth, man, from Alabama to Atlanta, which was a two hour drive one way, two hours back every day, five days a week for about 10 hours a day, uh, maybe a 10 months or a year before I had a shot. Wow, that is incredible. I, that's, that, that is the most in-depth someone has gone uh, when talking about the tryout. So that is the minutia I'm looking for. I like, the, uh, I like all the, the minute details, and, and uh, that's fantastic. Thanks for sharing. Um, time goes by. You're training there for a while. This is, in my research, this is what I found, that your debut match was against Perry Saturn. Is that correct? That's correct. And the way that comes about is this. You're working hard. You're at that training center every day. You, you're kind of meeting the guys ever so often. Some of the boys are coming in there and training. You're getting to meet them that way. And uh, you're getting better. You're getting better. You're owning your skills and you're doing all that you can. And, and you have this mix, right? Because you have sometimes you may have Diamond Dallas Page is going to come in and just going to get a workout in and want to train and want to be in the ring with these because he knows that they're hungry and they're going to make him better. And, and that was always a big plus. And then you've got guys in the middle of the road, like you talked about. you got a Lenny and a Lodi who are already having some opportunities to have some enhancement matches but aren't really maybe not under contract at that point, you know. And, and so they're in between being a trainer and being somebody that's on the full-time roster, you know. So you get those guys that you get to learn from and get to rub shoulders with. And then you have guys like a Chris Canyon that might be a mid-card, but – so such a hard worker that even though he's out there and he's on the road, he's constantly at the power plant as much as he can be when he's not on the road because it's important to him to keep training. So because of that, you get this great mix of different perspectives and different guys that are different levels in the business. And, and you learned really that uh, no one can answer for yourself when you're ready except yourself. I mean, you can get advice from these other guys and, and from the trainers but you have to kind of ask yourself, like I had an opportunity before to probably by the time I was three or four months in to start doing some indie shows because I wasn't under contract with the WCW. I could do whatever I wanted to do. Um, my mentality was I didn't want to go out there until I could hold my own against anybody. And not saying that I was going to immediately be a star by any means. I wanted to feel so good and so confident about my skills that I wasn't going to embarrass myself the first time I got in the ring if that makes sense. Yeah. And so I kept holding out and kept holding out and kept holding out. They did work that back then WCW did their TV taping for their Saturday night shows and their syndicated shows in Orlando. And they would do maybe three months worth of training uh, tapings, I think it was. I think it was three months worth of tapings in about yeah. a week's time. Something like that. Very condensed. It was a great setup, actually, when you think about it, because you could do that many shows – because there was a built-in audience. It's an attraction that's part of the larger theme park, right? Yeah. So you're filtering in audience and filtering them out, and you could run, I think it was something like four or five shows a day or something, you know, do a four or five takings a day, something to that effect. So the word was you could drive yourself down to, Atlanta on, uh, down to Orlando on your own dime if you wanted to, carry, carry your gear with you. When you get there, let the bookers, let them know, knock on that production truck door, and let them know that who you are, that you're from the power plant. So you've got kind of a loose affiliation with WCW. And if they need any extra guys just to go out there and be an enhancement talent or, or have some kind of a throwaway match like that, that you're there and you're ready and you're willing to work. And you might get an opportunity. That was the word. So that's how my first match with Perry Saturday came about. Mike Sanders and I, as a matter of fact, drove down to a Orlando together, my first trip down there, about 10 months into the business, took my gear with me, knocked on the door. Um, they opened the door and and let them know that I was there and I was willing to work. And you just hang around all day, not knowing if you're going to get a shot or you might get a shot. But once you get a shot, you see that it's worth it. Absolutely, bro. Yeah, I mean, uh, I always find the uh, Saturday night tapings to be uh, an interesting thing, especially I I've, I've got a list of matches here that I wanted to rattle off to you. Um, this is on WCW Saturday night. This is just your first, I mean, after Saturn, it's your next uh, five matches. July 7th, 98 in Macon, Georgia against Roadblock. 
uh, September 22nd in Amherst, Massachusetts against Lenny Lane, December 12th in Rome, Georgia against Scott Steiner, January 5th uh, in Gainesville against Glacier and January 19th. Uh, 1999 against Kaz Hayashi. That's just five matches that I just wanted to mention there. If you have any stories of those five matches, the floor is yours. Uh, please tell me what it's like doing these these uh, early matches in WCW. Okay, well I'll I'll, I'll do you I'll do this for you. Um, I'll disappoint you in one one respect, and then I'll give you a tremendous story in the other respect. How about that? Okay, so the, sounds the great. Disappointing Yes, when you're first starting out, man, and, and especially getting thrown into the mix very quickly, that life is a whirlwind. Brother, you're on the road 300 days out of the year. You're from one town to the next. And I've never been one of those dates guys. And I've never been – like, it impresses me when I sit down with someone and I'm being interviewed and you rattle these dates and you rattle off these matches because I'm thinking, I can't even do that and I was there, you know. <laughs> and, and it's because – Florida, man, you're from one town to the next. Like people would say, man, you got to see the world. You go, yeah, kind of, but there's only so many ways you can build a hotel, an airport, and an arena, and it all starts looking the same. So <laughs> I, I can't, I don't have a lot of great specific memories, although I can say this about the match with Scott Steiner. And I think you mentioned Rome, Georgia. I'm pretty sure That's that it, I, yeah. I got on that match because it was another one of those deals where. I wasn't really on the road and I wasn't under contract yet that I just drove to Rome because it was close enough to where I lived and let them know I was there, you know, and I was willing to work. And so I, I quickly built up this reputation wrestling guys like that, where if they went to the card and this is some inside baseball, but we had this big whiteboard that was backstage. And when they made the matches, they would lay them out on the whiteboard and you'd go and see who you're wrestling that night and what the card was. And if it was someone like a Scott Steiner, for instance, and they were just having a match where they're going to go out and obliterate somebody, right? Their mentality was they would go and they'd look on the card and they see where they're wrestling and they'd go to the booker and they'll say, is this just an enhancement match? Go, yeah, we just want you to go out there and just annihilate the guy. Well, then it doesn't matter who I wrestle. And if it doesn't matter who I wrestle because it's an enhancement match, I want to wrestle last because I know he'll make me look good. I know that he'll really sell for me and really put me over. And I took that as a huge compliment. Yeah, I didn't take it as, oh, I'm a guy. I took it like these guys want to work with me. And that that quickly gave me a reputation as someone that was a giver in the business, that was unselfish and was about getting the match over. And so when I wrestled Scott that particular night, in fact, I'm a very flexible guy, even for a bigger guy. And I, I think a lot of that flexibility comes from my amateur wrestling background. Yeah. And Steiner Recliner, if you watch that match, there's a moment there where he first puts me in there and I arched my back for him to such an extent. He almost trips backwards. <laughs> That's what that was. <laughs> because of the arch up in my back that they took a photo of it that at that time they did this series of cans. I guess it was probably only over here in the States, but at that time there was a, uh, a soda company that I don't think is around anymore called Surge. That was a oh, big right. uh, endorser. Yeah, they were a big uh, WW. And so they had this endorsement deal with them. And they made soda cans that had these guys' finishers on them. And I remember they took that picture of Steiner putting me in the Steiner recliner and put it on the Surge soda can. <laughs> and one of the first things in my career my that I thought was really cool was going into a convenience store or a gas station seeing a soda can with, with my face <laughs> on it. <laughs> That's fantastic. I'll tell you this, Surge did go away for a while, but they actually brought it back in the, um, maybe a few years ago. I managed to get myself a oh, carton, wow. a whole carton, 24 cans of it sent to my house because I just wanted to know what Surge tasted like after watching it on television, you know, 20 years prior. So I got yeah. it. It tasted fantastic, and I've still got one can left over, you know, as a little memento, because I always wanted to see what Serge tasted like. But I did watch the match with you and Steiner, and when he did lock that in, I was like, good gosh, <laughs> how is he yeah. How is he not broken in half? So that was, it was fantastic. Um, well, another testament to that type of trying to put guys over, 
it's funny because those two guys, Scott and, and Rick or Robbie, they, they always got a bad reputation of being extremely stiff in the ring. And I never found that myself, you know, and, and people would always ask me if, if they were difficult to work with, man, they were dreams to work with. They were great. And in my last match, not to fast forward or, or I certainly don't want to punchline anything you may ask me about later, but my last match at WCW was against Rick Steiner, against his brother. And there's this point at the beginning of the match where he punches me. And that apparently came across so stiff the way that I sold it and the way that we did that, that uh, even to this day, I'll get contacted every so often. And, and I've seen him get contacted and asked about it as well. That Why did you hate Lash LaRue so much that you hit him as hard as you hit him? And he's like, I didn't, you know, and, and he didn't, you know, he didn't stiff me, took care of me in that match. Both of them did. I always thought they were phenomenal guys in and out of the ring. And just, uh, I had great experiences with them as I did with most everybody I worked with. Awesome, bro. Love it. Love it. Uh, this is a big one. It's your Nitro debut, the 1st of February, 1999 at the Target Center in Minneapolis. You take on Billy Kidman for the Cruiserweight Championship. And in my research again on your Wikipedia article, it said that this match caught the eye of officials. Um, please, can you tell me a little bit about how excited you must have been to finally be on Monday Nitro? Yeah, it was, that was the pivotal point in my career. Um, and, and, and I'll guess, gosh, I don't want to be uh, too patronizing, and I certainly don't want to put myself on the pedestal, but if I were that guy that felt like I was in a position to give any advice to younger guys that were trying to get into the business, and I'm not going to pretend that I am, uh, because especially since I've been out of the business so long, and it's not like I'm some big legend. But if, if guys, young guys were asking my, my advice, I would encourage them to always have that attitude of wanting to work hard, wanting to make guys look good and doing what's asked of you within reason, because that's what gave me the opportunity against Billy Kidman. And because of the things I just told you about, where I was trying my best to make guys look good, to sell for them, to not be selfish. In fact, to, to go out of my way to do my job, which was to make them the star that they are, because of that type of attitude, someone like a Billy Kidman on that particular night comes to me and says, let's have a good match. This isn't just about getting me over. Let's have a good match. And because he gave me a good back and forth match, it made me. It made me. And how we got there was this. I was at the pub when I was training every day. And uh, to give you a as quick of a version as I can of a longer story, EA Sports out of Canada was doing their first ever wrestling video game. And it also happened to be the first game they'd ever done with the motion capture suit. And if you're familiar with motion capture, it's similar at that time to what they were doing like in Lord of the Rings with Gollum, you know, where they put the jumpsuit on the guy with all the sensors all over it. And they have all these different cameras that can put that in a computer and make a skeleton. And then you have not just animated uh, characters in a game, but you actually have real live motion from real wrestling moves in the game, right? Well, because of that, and them trying to work out the, the technical aspects of how they're going to pull it off, they accrued up, uh, WCW right at the beginning of the project to the power plant just to deal with guys doing some moves. And I was there training like I was every day. And they found out very quickly, they saw me get the ring. I was big enough that I could do all the power moves. You know, I was big enough, a strong enough guy that I could do all the power moves. I had this amateur wrestling background, so I could do all these uh, technical wrestling holds, you know, do these D. Malenko style chain wrestling. And then I was still athletic enough that I was one of the only guys that wasn't Mexican that was doing that Libre style you know, at the time, uh, maybe me and Billy Kidman were about the only two that were really doing some high flying Lucha Libre style that, that wasn't from Mexico. And uh, when they saw all that, man, they thought this is the perfect combination of exactly what we need for the, the game. And they politicked really hard to have me come to Vancouver to work on the video game for them. They wanted me to be the guy in the suit. Essentially, is what it came down to. And WCW's initial reaction was, he's just a trainee at the power plant. He's not under contract. Get one of our guys that are under contract 
because then you won't have to pay them. Well, EA Sports said, we want him so badly, we'll pay him ourselves, even if he's not on a contract. Awesome. So EA Sports paid me to come up there, and I worked on the video game. And after that first run, I wound up maybe making about three or four trips up there. And they were seeing what I was doing for EA Sports, and that was kind of getting their attention. Plus, they were seeing how hard I was working or looking on the um, as enhancement talent that they had just put the cruiserweight title on Billy Kidman. Uh, they were giving him a little bit of a push with it, a little bit of a run. And it was at a time when the way you made a champion look strong is each week just feeding somebody a credible opponent that he can have a good match with that makes him look strong. He gets a win. He comes out. He's a fighting champion. And you give him enough a string of those types of victories, and he's got some credibility with that title. So – I remember flying back uh, to, to, Alabama, to Atlanta and going to the power plant. It was a Friday. They called me on a Friday at the power plant because they didn't even have my home number at this point, WCW. <laughs> you know? And so they called me at the power plant to talk to me. And uh, it was uh, J.J. Dillon. Uh, they were booking me. He was informing me that they were going to book me on Monday Nitro in Minneapolis. Uh, and, again, like I said, I'm not a date guy and I'm not a city guy. But I will never forget that particular night, that particular match, because it was so pivotal for me. And they flew me out, and that was the first Nitro I'd ever been to. Got there, knew I was wrestling uh, Kidman. All they wanted me to do was just be one more cruiserweight guy to make Billy Kidman look like a credible champion. And as we're talking about the match and going over things, you know, Billy said, let's a great match. Let's just go out there. And so I think – to, to make a long story short, I think WCW thought we're going to have kind of a cruiserweight match that's just going to be an enhancement guy that makes Billy Kidman look strong. What they got was me coming out because by then I had done enough Saturday night shows that my mentality had been my time is from the curtain to the ring that I can do whatever I want to get my character over, even if I don't get anything in, in the match, right? I, even if I do no moves in the actual match, I could try to connect with the audience. And by then I'd sort of done that to a point that when I got with Billy, it wasn't just us having matches and moves. I'm trying to be charismatic and I'm trying to get my character over it during that, you know, time that we had together. And I think that connection, them seeing the extra little bit in my makeup there in my, in my development made them think that, Hey, we've got something that we could do something with here. Absolutely, bro. Yeah, it was a great match, and uh, it, it's that's a great backing story to it as well. And I'm going to go back to the video game stuff a little bit later on. Um, okay. But, <laughs> uh, but this is me being a nerd now. This is me wanting to name a few things. And as you said, you're not big on dates and cities and stuff like that. But I need to say this because it makes me feel better that I'm just – throwing all this chronological timeline into this interview. You get your first win against Lenny Lane, uh, a very much an unsung hero in the wrestling business on Saturday night in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, you make your Thunder debut on February 4th in Providence, Rhode Island, defeating Super Calo. You pick up wins over Bobby Blaze, Chava Guerrero, Lenny Lane again, before losing to Kidman on your WCW Worldwide debut on March 30th in Kitchener, Ontario, I believe, is how you pronounce it. Uh, <laughs> uh, you spend uh, the, I mean, the next six, six months, you spend a lot of time working matches on Thunder Saturday night, sometimes worldwide, and you make five appearances on Nitro. I just need to just like throw that in there because I didn't want to just skip ahead from February to October, but I want to get to October 1999 because you've had a bunch of wins on television now. You're starting to get built up. And this is, you know, a pretty important part because you're, you're very close to your pay-per-view debut. But before we even get to that, I want to ask you about how did you feel about Eric Bischoff going home, Bill Bush coming in, and eventually Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara coming in? My honest instinct, uh, instinctive answer to that is that it was a little above my pay grade at the time. And, and what I mean by this is I didn't really have a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction with Eric Bischoff by that point. 
Um, and that may sound odd to a lot of people. But the truth is, is you had this NWO thing that was just unbelievable, right? Uh, the, the, the power behind that and how over it was and what a cultural phenomenon it was. And between that and the other main event stars, like the things they were doing with Sting, which were extremely unique. And, and even you got Macho Man is still a player at that time. Roddy Piper is still a player at that time. And that those main event circles there had a tendency to sort of suck the energy out of the room in regards to your top echelon writers and bookers like an Eric Bill. So he's so all consumed with that. That's what you get. I think is again, I, I said the secret sauce to WCW, and I believe it, is guys like Eddie Guerrero and 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 Chris Jericho and Chavo Guerrero and Perry Saturn and uh e- even to uh to a certain extent uh, uh, other guys, the reason why they had freedom to do what they wanted to do in the ring and, and to kind of come up with their own angles and come up with their own book bookings and have their own matches. And the reason why they were so open to that is because th- the main bookers and main writers were so busy with the main event stuff that they, as long as they were putting out a good product, what did they care? Right. And so guys like Raven was another one I was trying to think of that that had a lot of freedom because of that, you know, Conan and all the stuff that he did with those guys. Um, so I, I wasn't really expecting at that point to be sitting there. I consider myself a superstar to the point that I'm going, I need to have Eric Bischoff on speed dial so that we're talking about my career on a regular basis. Right? Yeah. I was just happy to be part of the team. I was ecstatic that I'm the youngest guy under contract in WCW at the time. I think I started training when I was about 18 or so. And I was the youngest guy they had on a contract. And I was just blown away that I got to wear a jersey, you know, let alone <laughs> be on the team and, and be a player or be used. And uh, I'll go back to you mentioning those dates and mentioning those cities. Don't misunderstand me. When I say I've never been that guy that remembered those things, it doesn't mean I don't appreciate them. I appreciate it very much. And I appreciate being being reminded of those because it does this wonderful job of bringing back memories for me. And what I mentioned at the beginning there of things being a blur, what fans didn't realize is even though you might mention that uh, I made five, I think you said five natural appearances during that time or something. Yep. Um, even though I may only had five natural appearances, that means I only had five matches. I was at every nitro. Yeah. I was on the road constant. And so I was one of those guys that were a workhorse at that point. And, and WCW knew it. They knew I would do whatever they asked me to do. So I was on the road constantly. So even if I wasn't used on a particular show, I was still there. And I was yeah. still expected to be. I was still expected to be sitting on ready. And, and so for me, it wasn't, um, okay, I wasn't at that natural. I was at home. No, for me, it was, that was all a part of that one big long run of being on the road not individual shows. Uh, and so by the time Eric Bischoff goes home and you see that there's going to be a little bit of a changing of the guard, I didn't have any negative thoughts towards Eric at all. I didn't know Eric well enough at that point to have any negative thoughts. In fact, if anything, I appreciated the genius of what was going on with the NWO. Bill Bush, to wrestlers who were working for the company at the time, it just seemed like a corporate guy coming in that wasn't a wrestler guy. So it just felt like an outsider coming in, but words started coming out that the guys, Vince Russo and Ed Ferreira uh, were coming in uh, and that got a little bit of a buzz that got somewhat exciting for us because we'd seen that they were supposedly behind this, this thing that was going on in WWE that was getting over and, and becoming a big deal, this attitude era that was the WWF at the time, we we thought there'd be some excitement to that. And they came in, and that's the first time that in my career that I felt like bookers and writers were showing some interest in me as an individual. So, of course, I'm going to respond positively to that. Absolutely, bro. Yeah, like it just seemed, because I've seen that whole part, that, that, that first three months that Vincent – and Ed were writing the shows and uh, you could tell people were starting to get an opportunity that they never had before, like yourself or like a Norman Smiley 
uh, a bunch of guys that never really had many angles. I mean, Norman had a couple of things here and there, but now he was like definitely on Nitro every week and they were building him up and they were building up all these younger guys and kind of like putting the, you know, the older guys, you know, to the side for a bit because they wanted to break everything down and build a new foundation with the new guys so that the new guys, well, not the new guys, the younger guys can be, you know, in a sense, competitive and on the same level as the older guys once they bring the older guys back to TV. But anyway, apart from that, I'll get back into that in a minute, but uh, you, you start cutting more promos now uh, heading towards Halloween Havoc 1999. I remember one specifically in the ring with Mean Gene Oakland on Thunder. It's Kevin Nash's last day as Booker. You had defeated Al Green uh, earlier in the night. It's October 14th in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. You're on a four-match winning streak right here as you're heading towards this championship match with Disco Inferno. But as, as, as somebody that was a fan of wrestling before getting into the business, you must have been pretty excited to be standing in the ring with Mean Gene Oakland. I was not only was ecstatic to be standing in the ring with Mean Gene Oakland, but I'll be honest with you. I'm one of those kind of people that because of the things I went through when I was young, I don't get starstruck very easily. I don't get intimidated very easily. And I don't get it. I don't get nervous very easily. That particular moment, I was scared to death. And the reason why I was scared to death and was so nervous is because if I remember correctly, uh, this is as best I recall that that was not even slated to happen. That was not booked to happen. And we were backstage and I happened to just be hanging out in the same room that Kevin was in. And you mentioned he was, you know, he had the book at the time and someone had walked in and maybe a Kevin Sullivan or someone like that had come in and said, you know, we're, we're, we're five minutes live on the show. Meaning what that means is, is that uh, people's matches are going faster than they should, or the segments are going a little quicker than they should. And we've got time to fight. We're, we're ahead of the curve a little bit. And Kev just looks over like people do sometimes, and he goes, we're in Louisiana. The kid's supposed to be caged. You give him the stick and let him cut a promo. <laughs> and that's how that went. That's, that was the setup. So I had like five minutes notice that I was going to go out there and, and cut this promo. And it was amazing because it was my first time really in front of a crowd, and I can remember that hometown crowd. They got the whole Cajun flavor thing. And, uh, you know, I, I was doing the Laissez le bon temps rouler, let the good times roll. And they're singing it with me like it's a rock catchphrase. And it was big <laughs> for me. It gave me a lot of confidence that I didn't have before. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to mention that because uh, there's this compilation on YouTube of because uh, Kevin Nash decided to put himself on commentary that night with uh, Larry Zabisco and Mike Tanay. And it's there's so many inside references and jokes, and he's just. I think he's drinking as well whilst he's commentating the show. But the segment of you coming out to uh, be interviewed by Mean Gene, it comes up and Mike today is saying, oh, and the Raging Cajun Lash is coming out here for a bit of promo time, Kevin. And Kevin literally says on the air, yeah, like uh, we're running a little bit light on the show. So, and some guys <laughs> didn't show up. So we're, we're just throwing Lash out there just and then like today's like, oh, I, this is an all shoot edition of Thunder here tonight. <laughs> That's funny because I, I never, I've never watched that back, and I never knew that. I never <laughs> knew that story. I told you, I, I, I was saying that independent of ever hear, having heard that commentary. That's <laughs> I'll, I'll send you the link. There's a YouTube compilation of the show, but you'll you'll have a laugh over that. Um, That's uh, so you feud with Disco Inferno over the Cruiserweight Championship, and this is like something uh, really uh, an important match, at least for me, because I had the VHS tape. I, I bought it when I was, a uh, you know, geez, how old would I have been then? Uh, 12 years old, 11 years old. Uh, but I had the VHS of the show. So I've seen the show a multitude of times, especially back then, but it's Halloween Havoc 1999 Disco Inferno October 24th at the MGM grand in Las Vegas. It's now Lash Vegas. Uh, with this matchup, please tell me how did how excited you must have been to be on pay per view and and to be working with Disco Inferno. Well, I was super excited. Um, I was extremely nervous. Uh, there was maybe three times in my career where I was uncontrollably nervous. Other times, I was pretty cool with most everything that that happened. But 
the, the times when I was the most nervous was the Mean Gene interview that we just mentioned, the Billy Kidman match that was my Nitro debut, and then this particular match because the crowd was ridiculously large, man. We were just – it was sold out the MGM Grand. It was big. It was a pay-per-view. I was the first match out. So you know that you have to kind of set the tone. Um, there's this pressure that you go, okay, can I really – and I deliver. And I felt like that was the culmination of a lot of hard work getting up to that point. Um, because again, I'm not somebody that they ever sat down with me and said, here's our plan with you, this last LaRue character. That that was just an evolution for me. And all the stuff that came with that. Now they they put this one out together and they kind of gave us um a feud there and, and booked us against each other, but we were booked against each other. It's not like we sat down and, and had all these things written out. So stuff like Viva Las Vegas and things like that were just things I came up with on my own, you know, and I just threw in the mix without really, to be honest with you, I didn't even get that approved by anybody. That's when I had a t-shirt. <laughs> I would mention, I'd drop it in the interviews. And I did that with most of the stuff that I did. Uh, uh, and, and so, again, that match, that particular match, which I'm very proud of, uh, was a culmination of, of evolving that character from the first time I ever went out, going out as my shoot name, Mark LaRue, to now suddenly I'm the Raging Cajun Lash LaRue. And all of that was just me doing a slow burn, a slow build on, on bringing that where it was because uh, – really give you the quick version of that as a matter of fact that the evolution of Lash LaRue as it were, were my real name is Jonathan Mark Lash LaRue now that's my legal name I was born Jonathan Mark LaRue when I went out and I wrestled for the first time I knocked on the door of the production truck told my name down there in Orlando we talked about that had that match with Perry Saturn they probably even have me booked they may have me booked as Mark LaRue in that match. I had a couple of early matches with WCW where I booked as Mark LaRue. And uh, I remember that trip in Orlando, Terry Taylor was one of the bookers. And Terry Taylor was really known for his very sarcastic humor. And uh, I walked in and I introduced myself to, to Terry. And I said, Mr. Taylor, I just want to introduce myself to you. I'm Mark LaRue. He just looked at me, didn't shake my hand and said, I'm sure you are, kid. And walked off. <laughs> and that's when it hit me. You know, Mark is probably not the best name to have in the wrestling business. So, uh, <laughs> because my last name is LaRue, there's an old cowboy from the 30s that in the United States, uh, Lash LaRue. He spelled his last name differently, but he was one of the first guys at the time of Roy Rogers and the Lone Ranger and that sort of thing. He wore all black and had a whip. And so, old school guys were in the guy that ran the power plant at the time was Jody Hamilton. And from day one, Jody Hamilton always called me Lash LaRue because my last name was LaRue. <laughs> and so I had in the back of my mind this idea of wrestling as Lash LaRue. And he actually gave me a great bit of advice. And I was barely 18. And he said, uh, kid, if I were you, I would just go home and I would add Lash to my name legally. I wouldn't really change my name. I wouldn't make it just like, – I'd just add it. I'd stick it in there, go to the probate office, pay 25 bucks, completely add it. So I did that. You know, like a woman getting married that changes her last name. I just went to the probate office, petitioned the court at 18 years old, and just added the last to my name. And uh, and so by that point, I went up to – I got up to Terry Taylor. I said, do you mind if I wrestle his last for reason? I don't care what you wrestle as. Knocked on a production truck. Told them my name is Lash LaRue. They started putting that on, underneath the byline there. So that never came from a booking office or anything like that. Fast forward, as I'm wrestling and doing these enhancement matches, I would just put Raging on one side of my tights and Cajun on the other. Kind of hard to ignore that if you're calling the matches. If you're Mike Tanay or if you're Scott Hudson or if you're Tony Schiavone or if you're Bobby Heenan or Larry Zabisco, they're going to pick up on that. Dusty Rhodes, they're going to pick up on that. And so they started calling me the Raging Cajun. I kind of made it so without it being a fish. Then I'd add Mardi Gras beads, throw Mardi Gras beads out. Um, I, they told me very quick when I got to WCW that I looked too young, that I needed to grow my hair out, and I needed some facial hair. So I got these big pork chop sideburns because I was a huge Elvis fan. And also because everybody had goatees in the 90s, so I didn't want to go to. 
And so uh, I looked in the mirror one day, and I guess it's the artistic side of me. I thought, you know what? I could shave those into L's. And so I made those L's initials on the side of my face, and I would come out and kind of allude to that. And I was playing off of double L's off of everything that I did. My hometown, Lafayette, Louisiana, the heart of Cajun country. It's an L and it's an L. And so all these little subliminal things I put in, I do the old double L coming out. I had a T-shirt that I made a logo that was an L and an L. Uh, and Jackie Crockett, who worked the little floor camera, at, uh, WCW, as you're coming to the ring, he, he's the one that pointed out to me, he says, if you, those sideburns are an L, point to them when you come out. He said, I'll take care of the rest. And I'd come out and do the old as I'm going to the ring <laughs> and that all those little small things get over because they build up to a bigger character. So I say all that to say that by the time I get to Halloween havoc, I've established all these things without ever getting pushed one, you know, uh, you didn't have to sit down and have this big long drawn out storyline that you've written on who Lashler is for the fans to get it. The fans are smarter and we give them credit for it. Yeah. I throw out some Mardi Gras beats. Okay, he's Cajun. He's, he's, you know, he's bringing the party with him. It's a character. And you want to play into that character every way that you possibly can. And, and one of which was Viva Las Vegas. Here we are at the pay-per-view, me and Disco Inferno. And because of all those things and me being a young guy, I didn't have to win that match for it to help me tremendously. Absolutely. And it did help you tremendously. Your pay-per-view debut, what a match. Uh, and thank you so much for all of that story there. I really should have asked about that earlier, but, you know, I always knew when I was watching, you'd always point to the facial hair. I could tell that they were L's. I could see that as time was wearing on, you were adding more and more and more things. And uh, I already knew who Lash LaRue was. I didn't need any backstage vignettes or any character vignettes to be recorded of you and you tell tell the viewer exactly who you are i was figuring it out on my own as you said you know the wrestling fan isn't as you know clueless as some people might think that they are uh but here's a, a really cool part of your career here you and disco end up joining forces and uh you're you're feuding with tony marinara uh, but better known uh, later on as uh, Tony Marmaluke from ECW and his henchmen, the Marmalukes, Big Vito and Johnny the Bull. Um, and the story was obviously because uh, Disco was a compulsive gambler and he owed them money. I love this storyline. Uh, <laughs> this was really fun. Uh, tell me, for the first time now in your wrestling career, you're getting to be a part of an angle that's actually, you know, got some you know, elements to it. And uh, please tell me about how, how you felt about working with Disco closely in this and, and the other guys as well. I'll say a few things about that, Carl, is, is you're absolutely right. It's the first time in my wrestling career that I've actually been handed some kind of a storyline. Mm. I've been asked to be a, some kind of an angle. And uh, that was really cool to me. And because it was so new to me, I really didn't know what to do with it, you know. Hindsight's always 2020. I wish I'd had more experience than I did at the time because now I see what a gift that is. And I felt like I could have done a lot more with it now than I did then rather than just, I thought my job at the time was to show up and do what was asked of me. So I'm going to do it to the best of my ability, but I didn't speak up a lot. I didn't, um, I didn't try to think of creative ways to add things to it because I was just happy they were giving me something. And I look back now in the mind that, Disco Inferno has for the wrestling business is very underrated. Disco is a phenomenal worker. And, and people misunderstand, by the way, the difference between being a great worker and being a great wrestler. You could make the argument that Disco maybe is not the greatest wrestler in the world if you want to try to match somebody hold for holes and move for moves because he may have a limited repertoire there when it comes to in-ring performance. But of the things that he did do, he did very well and very believably, and his character was phenomenal, and his psychology was always right on point, and he told his story, and this has, I, I never sit down and ask Disco about it, but that whole storyline to me has his fingerprints all over it. It just sounds like his type of personality is something he would come up with, and then I, 
to, to think back now and to think that he asked me to be a part of that and asked me to be his partner, I wish I had been smarter with the business that I've been so young in it so that I could have done even more with it, tried my best to get it even more over than it was. Because uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that little short run that we had together. And, man, it, it was. It was the first time I really felt like I was a part of something that was more than just a wrestling match. Absolutely. And those bro. guys were great to work. Oh yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, Johnny the Bull, an incredible athlete, and then Big Vito seemed to be able to get himself over anywhere he went. Um, and uh, you know, as far as like Disco is concerned, the fact that it's about something to do with gambling, of course, he's got his fingerprints on it. I think. Uh, <laughs> sure. Funny story. Uh, a couple, a couple of anecdotes to go along with that angle, since you asked. Me about that angle johnny the bull was one of those guys that came through the power plant too not long after i did so got that power plant connection there and and that was really cool and then another thing is we had a match i want to say i may be wrong because again i'm not the i'm not the date guy and i'm not the city guy but i think it was in buffalo new york that we had a match that was like a body bag match and i remember it was super cold so i was like 30 degrees outside and uh, the, they get the win. They put me in the body bag, and, and they zip it up. And this was a real body bag. I don't know where they got it from, but this was a real body bag. And so it's airtight, and they zip it up, and they throw me over their shoulder, and they're walking out of the arena with me. And the deal on it was we got to the back, and then there WCW had gone to commercial. And when they come back from commercial – they're going to throw me into the uh, trunk of the car and drive off with me, right? <laughs> yeah. So to give me a little bit of a breather, I had just had this long match. This going, I had this tag team match against them. Uh, I've worked. I'm sweating. I'm pouring sweat. They put me in this airtight body bag, and it's like vinyl or whatever they're made out of. I'm sweating profusely. They get me outside the loading dock where the car is. And they decided, okay, you need a breather because those body bags are airtight during the commercial before we throw you in the trunk. So they unzip the body bag, and I come rising up out of that thing, and I go, and take a deep breath because I couldn't breathe out of it. And when I did, I pulled it my lungs. And I remember getting pneumonia for like a week and a half after that. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Um, I will correct you though. It was in New Orleans yeah. that that happened. Oh, really? Okay. And uh, <laughs> you, you actually won the match, but I guess you were attacked afterward and you were just put in the body bag anyway. <laughs> but uh, that, that checks out. That checks out. <laughs> it was um, cold. Even if it was New Orleans, it was cold. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, so, uh, as I was going to say, um, as you're heading towards Starcade 1999, uh, and it's going to be a tag team match, and this is along the way, you get 13 wins and two losses on various shows and house shows leading to Starcade 99. Just want to throw that out there because I like the numbers of that. Um, yeah. But you face, along with Disco, Big Vita and Johnny Ball in a tag team match at Starcade 1999 at the MCI Center in Washington. Um, you guys lose the match due to a miscommunication. I'm assuming this might be leading to a feud between you and Disco. Uh, first of all, tell me how it feels to be able to say, I wrestled on a Starcade and, and, and that experience there. And also, was this leading to some sort of feud again with Disco? It's the granddaddy of them all, baby. It's Starcade, if you will. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was great for that. And I look back on those things and again. I was so excited and so wrapped up in just being on the team, so to speak. And, and I walked on a shells, Carl, from the standpoint of I knew I was a young guy under contract, and I was the youngest guy in WCW at the time. And so I was very conscious of trying to never be anything less than professional. So I probably didn't enjoy those moments as much as I should. They're sweeter memories for me looking back than they were in the moment because in the moment I was so caught up in looking like I belonged and looking like I was just being, uh, again, the consummate professional that I tried to treat every event like it was my job and I'm going to do the best job that I could possibly do. And I, I, I wish I had embraced the excitement of the moment more 
uh, at that particular time, man. But I can look back and I can say I was a part of that, you know. And along those same lines, you asked about the Disco Inferno plans. Really didn't know what the next plans were for this week. That, that's just the truth. So you could kind of see the writing on the wall, but you really couldn't see the writing on the wall any different than a wrestling fan that was sort of smart to the business sees the writing on the wall. That you go, okay, the natural progression on this is for Disco and I, if we're going to break up and turn it into another feud and maybe take it to the next level, even beyond what we did before. And I just don't guess we ever really got to that point, you know. No, and and I'm and I'm sure it's because uh, you know early 2000. This is when uh, Vince Russo goes home for a few months. I believe another three months. Uh, so he was there for three, left for three, and then came back. But uh, it, it just because I've 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 watched all of this recently, and I I just noticed that soon soon after this, Disco was with Vito and Johnny. And uh, Tony Marinara had left WCW, but you weren't even really a part of the story going forward, which I was like, oh, would I, I would have thought that he would have still been a part of that. But uh, anyway, doesn't matter. But it's still, that was a great story up until Starcade there. Um, so how did you feel when Vince Russo left? Uh, and I know Kevin Sullivan took over. And then, of course, Benoit, Guerrero, Malenko, and Saturn also leave uh just after sold out 2000. Well, you have two different thoughts. Uh, at least I did. My, my, my mentality is twofold. On the one hand, I didn't want to see Vince go just because I felt like I was being treated well, obviously. And I felt like I was getting some opportunities and you never know what the change is going to bring for you. What is it going to mean for you as an individual talent? Right. Uh, you can argue whatever the psychology is for the entire company as a whole. But for you as a talent, you just know that you're being used and you being used in a pretty uh, productive way. And you don't want that to go away. And you don't want Vince Russo going home to mean that that goes away. On the yeah. other hand, on the other hand, your mentality is uh, it's a job. It's this weird career that is part marketing yourself constantly and just trying to do job and do it well. And for me, I was always just the workhorse guy that says, you know what, if, if I keep my head down and I work hard and I do what's asked of me, then I'm always going to have a job, you know, regardless of who the booker is. And I always tried to work with that mentality. Like I never got caught up in the politics. I never tried to make whoever the next writer is my best so that I'm constantly being used or constantly being in the mix. I just wanted to work hard and be talented and let that speak for itself so that no matter who was in charge and who's calling the shots, they I wanted them to think that Lash is a guy I want on my card. Absolutely, bro. Um, and, yeah, that's a great uh, way to go about it for sure. Kevin Sullivan takes over the book now. Uh and things are still happening for you, though. It's not like you're you're not doing anything during this time period. There's a cruiserweight title tournament. You beat Evan Courageous on January 31 on Nitro. Shannon Moore on uh, February 8th in the semifinal before heading to Super Brawl 10 in San Francisco, California on February 20th to lose to the artist, artist formerly known as Prince Ikea for the championship. I was really hopeful that you were going to win the belt at this point. Um because, you know, Prince Ike had been TV champion before at this point. But were you hopeful that you might win the belt at this point? I was uh, very much so. But at the same token, um, I'll be honest with you, I've always tried very hard, which is difficult in this business. A lot of wrestlers want to admit that it's difficult. But it's difficult. I've always tried to not be a mark for myself. And, and I'm certainly not a belt mark. You know, and what I mean by that is I get that it can help your career and I get that it gives you credibility and it, it will establish you as a real true bona fide player. But I always looked at it like what difference does it make in the, in, the, in the big spectrum of things? You know what I mean? Like, for instance, I have this wonderful career that I love sitting down and talk to you and you can remind me on certain things that I've even forgotten about. And I think, man, what a sweet memory that is and how wonderful that is. And that's great. This time together, it's just a blast. But man, you can look around my studio. This is my office that we're in right now. 
don't have memorabilia all over the place. I don't have photos of myself up on the wall. I don't have glass encased, encased trophies of belts that I've won. And, yeah. and I'm not knocking the guy that do. Don't misunderstand me. I think that all these things are great accomplishments that not everybody can say that they've had a part of. But at the same token, that's just not me. That's not my mentality. And so I always looked at it like if I'm going into a match and I'm not booked to win the title, then th these guys, they must be smarter than me and it must be better business for me to not be the champion. And if it's good business for me to be the champion, then I'll be the champion. You know, uh, that was my mentality on it. And I was just, I was, I was proud to be a part of that match. I was proud to be wrestling Chris Ikea, who I knew I could have a great match with, you know, uh, it, it, in the big scheme of things, I felt like to be disappointed about something like that is to be extremely ungrateful and to be incredibly disingenuous because it's a work. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, bro. Okay, right here, right now, Lash, I'm going to take a little sidebar in this interview and talk about something called Lashing Out from WCW Magazine because I have a few editions of WCW Magazine. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I thought I'd take the time. I, I, I've brought out four, four of the magazines. I'm sure there's plenty more. But um, this one right here is uh, the edition with Booker T on the cover. Uh, Lashing out by Lash LaRue. Uh, look, Mrs. Jarrett, I'm very sorry, but I just don't think that Jeff is responding very well to his guitar lessons. I just wanted to, I don't know if the, the light's too bright, but that one right there. A little bit, yeah. That's fantastic <laughs> stuff. Okay, so that's the first one I wanted to show. I thought that was very creative. I noticed that there's a theme here where you pick on Jeff Jarrett a little bit, which I like, uh, because <laughs> here we go. Um, okay, uh, this one, Lashing Out by Lash LaRue. Uh, Dusty Rhodes is uh, riding somebody here. I believe it's uh, Double J. I believe that it's time for the dream to tame this all wild double J, if you will. I love this. This is fantastic. Will. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant stuff. Okay, we've got two more to go. Two more to go. I just really thought it was important to bring this out here because this is another passion you have in life. Uh, Sugar Shane, bad news. The FAA voted to limit the high spots in your match. So let's check uh, that one out right there. Can you yeah. see and that? Yeah, and by the way, the head Pereira that I drew the back of the head of there. <laughs> yeah, was it? I don't know that, but that's Ed Ferreira he's talking to. That's talking to him. <laughs> I was wondering, I wasn't sure if it was Mike Graham or if it was uh, uh, Ed Ferreira. But, uh, and then this this one here, I'm not sure who's getting the haircut. Maybe you can tell me. Could you take a little off the sides and put a lot on the top? Maybe you can... Uh, let me know what this one's all about. Uh, Jesus. Oh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's uh, Alan Funk. That's oh, just, but, it's Queewee. It's Queewee. He, he had the hair going straight up as Queewee. Do you remember that? Of course, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to throw those four out there. I'm sure there's plenty more. I've, I've got almost every edition of the magazine. But how did you feel about, you know, being able to utilize your other talent as a cartoonist for the magazine? Well, it came about by accident, man, like a lot of things in my life. And it's kind of been in the right place at the right time, I guess. I've always enjoyed drawing. Two things in life that I never thought that I would make careers out of was uh, wrestling and my artwork. And I've been blessed to do both. And um, my work has evolved a lot since then, as a matter of fact. You know, and I, just, <laughs> I was kind of learning as I went. And the way that that started for me, it's actually a tremendous story. You would get to these shows uh, you'd have to be there at noon for a show that didn't go live if it's not dropped until 7 p.m., you know? And uh, so you're there with a lot of downtime. And the reason for that is you're in a different town every night. You're in a different arena. They want to make sure nobody's missed their flight. They want to be certain that uh, you're getting lost in transit. If you have some local uh, promotional things to do or interviews, they want to make sure you have plenty of time to do that if you have pre tapes So there's a lot of good reasons why you need to be there early. But if you're one of those guys that maybe you're not on the card that night, but you still have to be there, you've got a lot of downtime. Yeah. So I noticed in these are with these professional sports, they would have these dry erase boards in the locker rooms 
uh, <laughs> for drawing up plays or anything else. You know? And I started carrying around dry ice markers with me. And I would just randomly draw the, the boys on the, on the boards back then. And the person who very quickly became one of my big fans when it came to my caricatures that I was drawing of other guys was uh, Kurt Henning, which is completely <laughs> natural because he was such a practical jokester. And Kurt gave, gave me a great line, in fact, that I keep using even today because I can remember we're sitting in the locker room one day and Kurt's just laughing at everything I'm drawing. And he goes, draw Hulk Hogan. Oh, okay. So I draw Hulk Hogan. Remember, I'm the young guy that doesn't want to get heat with anybody. Yeah. And he goes, now draw him really old. Um, okay. <laughs> so I draw him. He goes, now draw him with a Walter. Uh, all right. I'm not sure if I should do that, but okay. I'm, I draw him with Walter. He goes, now draw him with an oxygen mask. I go, Kurt, what if it gets hot <laughs> in the other, other room? And Kurt goes, look, you tell him you don't write the news. You just report it. <laughs> which I think is a great line. And uh, and he would just sit back and laugh, push me on and push me on and draw all these things. Well, Ross Foreman, who was uh, in charge of WCW Magazine at the time, saw me drawing these cartoons, and it was his idea for me to draw for the wrestling magazine, for WCW Magazine. And I'd never – I had tried to be published before in some magazines. Uh, in fact, quick story – parenthetical side note to that right when I first tried out for WCW uh, WCW at the power plant, I had done that because I was trying to sell cartoons for wrestling magazines. I took a semester off from college and uh, not wrestling magazines, but just magazines in general rather. And I sent off some submissions to some publications. And right after I made the power plant, I had three magazines that had bought a couple of my cartoons. And I always wonder if my, if my uh, career had uh, maybe gone in a different direction, if I had sold those cartoons before I did wrestling. But anyway, uh, I started uh, doing cartoons for the wrestling magazines. And not long after I did the first one for WCW magazine, Bill Apter, who was doing PWI at the time, had asked me to, to do some for him. And I think they did Battle Magazine not long after, uh, something like that a new actor magazine and he wanted me to do cartoons for him. I always felt a sense of loyalty to WCW because that's where I was at. And that's where I was under contract. So I kept lashing out there until WCW was sold. And then uh, I started doing cartoons for PWI for pro wrestling illustrated and the wrestler. And I did that for about another five or six years. So I probably did wrestling cartoons for 10 or 15 years, you know, that lashing out, just to play off my name again and in that lashing out series. And uh, I love doing it. It just got to the point where it, it was a uh, project of love. I was putting more time into it than I, what I was probably getting compensated for. Uh, and so it just from a business standpoint, it didn't make sense anymore, but it was fun. And the first cartoon I ever did, by the way, uh, I did Goldberg. I drew Goldberg with these huge traps that were so large that they were covering up his ears and there's a kid asking for his autograph and, and Bill looks at him and says, I'm sorry, what'd you say your name was? I can't hear you. My traps are in the way. <laughs> and, uh, and I can remember I took that and back then I didn't know anything about digital art. I was teaching myself and, and, and learning as I went. And I would literally draw these cartoons on a piece of typing paper. I would ink them. And then I would color them by hand with markers and color pencils and give them a hard copy, give Ross Foreman a hard copy for the magazine. And so uh, I showed that to Bill and I said, uh, hey, 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 Bill, I just want to make sure you're cool with this cartoon before I give it to the magazine because I didn't want to get any heat with anybody or anyone take it the wrong way or be offended. And Goldberg looks at the cartoon and he looks at me and he looks at the cartoon and he goes, bro. If you keep drawing me that big, you can write anything you want to write. So <laughs> after that, I quit asking anybody their opinion on the cartoons. I would just draw them and turn in. <laughs> That's brilliant, Brian. And a little fun fact. When I was a kid, my dream job to, was to be a cartoonist. And I went to, uh, uh, I don't know how old I was. I must have been 10 years old. I went to this, uh, it was like a lesson and it was about 20 people in the room and, you know, to teach everyone how to, you know, be a cartoonist. And it was then I realized I can't draw. 
it was so devastating for this little version of me to realize I really, I can't do it. Like I just, I, I, my pen, penmanship has been always been just horrible. So just, I just want to throw that out there that, you know, I see, you know, a, a comparison there. I wanted to do it, but I actually couldn't do it. <laughs> well, I'll say this really quick. Um, you know, growing up, I was a big fan of Mad Magazine. I don't know if you're familiar with Mad Magazine. I had a hell of a Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, then you can appreciate this. And most guys that I have met that are that are artists and illustrators, they grew up being big fans of comic books. And they loved all the superheroes. I was never a comic book guy. I was never a superhero guy. I loved Mad Magazine. And the reason why I loved them was because – you're opening this thing up, man. And when they would parody and make fun of a movie or a TV show, it's like, not only does this have to be a good drawing, not only does it have to be like a comic strip or, or a comic book in telling the story, but it better look just like that that uh, celebrity that you're making fun of in order for you to get the point across. And that's when I fell in love with the caricature. Because I'm going, man, this is a cartoon version of Tom Cruise, and it looks just like Tom Cruise. This is amazing, man. That's phenomenal. And so I, I just grew up loving that. And you can probably see shades of Mad Magazine in a lot of my lashing out cartoons because they're very caricature driven. And I've always loved caricature because of that, the exaggeration of a portrait of somebody that makes it instantly recognizable. And one of the old uh, Mad Magazine artists that I grew up on was a guy by the name of Mort Drucker who was just a phenomenal talent. And he did all of the old parodies, man, from probably his run, I bet, went from the 60s at least until into the uh, almost the 90s, the early 90s. And so he's just a phenomenal artist. And I saw an interview with him. And he was asked a very good question. How much, of, uh, how much artistic talent do you think is God-given versus learned? How much is just absolute talent which is a skill. And he said, I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you this. I've never met a little kid that didn't enjoy drawing. Just some people keep drawing and some stop. It's like, you know, Carl, the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. Uh, I think most people that have an interest in it, if they stay at it, stay at it, stay at it, you're going to find your voice and find your style. And even the, even rough drawings can kind of come into their own. And, and become a style that's very appealing themselves. Same thing with singing, anything else, man, playing an instrument. You know, you get kids that just have an interest in that for whatever reason. They take it up and they just stay with it until they become good at it. Yeah. No, I totally get what you mean, man. Like, I, for, for whatever reason that day, I realized, okay, I, I'm not very good at this. And then I just gave up. If I just kept on going, it would have been yeah. like me. I, I, I sing in a rock and roll band. And when I first started, I wasn't very good, but I wanted this and it took 12 years for me to get good. And finally I was actually good. So anyway, enough about me, enough about me, but <laughs> you know, perseverance does pay off. And I wanted to talk about spring stampede 2000. Now uh, you're at the United United Center in Shire town on April 16th. There's a six man cruiserweight title match with Candido crowbar, Shannon Moore, uh, Prince Ikea, the artist, and Juventud Guerrero, and yourself. This is the first pay per view with Eric Bischoff and Vince Russo together. How did you feel when you found out Russo was back? Uh, mixed emotions. I mean, at that point, if I'm just being blunt and brutally honest about it, uh, you could feel that there was a bit of instability in the company. Yeah. And so what winds up happening in those type of situations, and, and it's unfortunate. <laughs> Because I think overall it makes for a, a more inferior product. What winds up happening is you create this sense of instability and the guys really can't find their foot. You're, you're far more concerned about just keeping the company going and keeping a job than you are about um, whether or not how creative you can a match or how great the match is and whether or not it's a five-off match because you really don't know what the overall environment is going to be, the overall atmosphere. So I think that created some difficulties because of that reason. Uh, but again, with that being said, I was never a political animal in the wrestling business. So it was kind of uh, a lot of that stuff was 
closed doors, behind the scenes type of things that had nothing to do with what how good my match was going to be. Just to turn me loose and tell me what I'm doing tonight. Get in the ring really and do something. Right. Um, so now I want to get to a very important part of the interview. Misfits in action. When did you first hear about yeah. the idea of the Misfits in action? This is so cool. I really like this is a very underrated stable in wrestling history as far as I'm concerned. But when did you first hear about this idea? When I first heard about it, it was around the time that I first met Vince uh, Russo. And, and the reason why is because of this. Uh, Vince, came, Vince Russo came in as fans that were a part of that stable. And one of the reasons why I'm extremely proud of the work we did as a Misfits in Action is because we never booked to get over. And what I mean by that is Vince told us to our face. You know, I, I, I spoke before about when it came to being Lash LaRue and establishing myself and getting my feet underneath me in the wrestling business, nobody had ever really sat down with me and said, this is what we envision for you as a character. This is where we think you can go. And this is what we think you're capable of. Nobody had ever done that with me as Lash LaRue. That the exact opposite was true when it came to the Misfits in action. This Russo literally sat down with me, Booker T, uh, Chavo Guerrero and Hugh Morris and said to us, we think you guys are extremely talented and we have nothing for you. So here's the problem. We can either stick you all together and find out a creative way to do it, or I'm going to have to send you all home. And we're like, well, what would you, what do you got in mind? What do you want us to do? And he said, here, here's what the idea that we have is literally Vince Russo said, have you ever seen the movie stripes go home and watch the movie stripes we're going to put you and give you this military type gimmick and you're basically comic relief. You know, Stripes was this old military movie that was made like, I think in the late eighties, early nineties, something like that, maybe mid eighties. It might be even older than that. With like Bill Murray and Harold Ramis. And I think John Candy, a lot of those old comedians like that. It was just a, a spoof, a goofy show, but he was a big proponent of there being some levity in a wrestling show, you know, throughout the wrestling show, you've got just like with a match, you don't want a match that is the same level all the way through. You want your high spots and your ups and your downs, and you want to take people on a roller coaster ride. Well, you want to do the same thing with the entire show as a whole. And he saw us as being an opportunity to add a little comedy to the show and just be comic relief. And we were booked to be comic relief. He told us to our face, that's what we want you to be, which we were totally okay with. We didn't have a problem with that. And it started out that way, but, because of the guys that you put together in that group. Um, and I, especially myself, Chavo, and Hugh. And um, when I say Hugh, I mean Bill DeMott. I'll, he'll always be Hugh to me. But, uh, but especially, uh, you know, Hugh, you put us together, we're great workers, and we're constantly looking at, okay, how can we take what they've given us and take it to the next level and make it even better? What can we do to, to make the most out of this? And the only reason why I don't put Booker T – into that group because Booker T has the same mentality, but Booker T didn't stay with us very long. I mean, it didn't take long for them to see his talent and for him to break away and do something totally different. But for a while there, it was cool for him to come in as GI bro again and be a part of the misfits. But, uh, and that was very, very short lived. But for us, like for instance, something as simple as they said, we want you to all wear camouflage. Okay, so they send production people to the local army surplus store to just buy us camos to wear the urban colored camo. And again, my mentality was, okay, what can I do with this to make me stand out, and make me different? Do you care how I wear the camo as long as I'm wearing a camo? Well, no, we don't. All right. So I took two different colors, took them to the uh, wardrobe department, and I said, I want you to split them up the middle and sew one colored leg to the other colored leg. So I stand out and I look different, you know? You now I did that, I took my wrestling boots and I only laced them up halfway and folded the tops down. So they look more like military style boots instead of just wrestling boots. Uh, they gave me a bucket hat like they wore in Desert Storm. So I cut a hole through the top of it, pulled my hair through. Uh, <laughs> still wore my Mardi Gras beads so that I had that Cajun flavor to it. Wore my sunglasses, you know? And, and I think that what that did for us is it allowed our individual characters to shine and to stand out and us to be distinctively different in the type of people we were, but still look very much like a team and very cohesive. 
as a group together. All right, bro. And uh, like, uh, I, I want to really uh, zero in here on how you feel about each member of that group, because it was a great group and it was a big part of your career. And I guess I want like a bit of a, not a word association, but I'm going to name somebody and I want you to tell me how you feel about them. So let's start off with Hugh Morris, a.k.a. General Rection. He's the greatest, biggest, hottest guys I've ever met before in my life. Huge heart, big teddy bear. Has gotten a bad rap in the last few years that I think is just undeserved from my perspective. Uh, from the time I started in the wrestling business, he was very, very good to me. It was very much the big brother to me. And, and that's probably, if someone said word association, big brother, because big brother for me entails that he was a protector while at the same time being very kind of me, uh, being uh, teaching me a lot, being a mentor, uh, being out there beside me, being a friend when it needed to be a friend and being a great leader. Uh, and it's funny that you mentioned him because totally unrelated to this, I don't talk to a lot of the guys very often anymore. You just We're going in different directions. We're at different points in life. Uh, Hugh just tried to call me a couple of days ago, and uh, we missed each other and played phone tag, but uh, we're looking to catch up this week, as a matter of fact. He's somebody I still keep in close contact with uh, because there's a lot of water under the bridge there, man, and we experienced a lot together and just a phenomenal guy and one of the best big men to ever be in the sport as far as athleticism is concerned. Absolutely, bro. I've always been a massive fan of his. And actually, I've been messaging him recently, trying to lock down a date this month. Uh, I still haven't locked anything in with him, but I, uh, you know, I hope to speak with him soon because he's somebody that I certainly was a big fan of and have been a big fan of over the years. Um, the next person that I want you to tell me how you feel about is somebody that I've met in person. Uh, I wrestled on the same show as him in, oh, my gosh, 2014. Uh, Mr. Chavo Guerrero, Jr., a.k.a. Lieutenant Loco. A gentleman, complete gentleman. What a phenomenal guy he is, man. And he's a great worker, was a great, was a great partner, was extremely unselfish, was so talented, man. And, and again, an underrated worker. Um, I, I don't know why. Chavo doesn't get more accolades than he does. I couldn't have asked for someone to compliment me from a stylistic standpoint more than Chavo did. And we always had great chemistry in the ring. I feel like Chavo could work with anybody. Absolutely, bro. And, and the one time I did meet him, and I'll make this real short, but we were wrestling on the same show together. And um, it was here, here in Perth, Western Australia. And I spoke to him after the show and I was like, hey, man, do you want to have a beer? He's like, yeah, I can, I can sink a few Coronas. So I went to the liquor store uh, from the, the building that we had wrestled at. I went there and I bought a six pack of Corona and I came back and I drove back and I'm like, okay, I'm going to have a few beers with Chava Guerrero. And as I walked out my car and I've got that six pack in my hand, I see the promoter of the wrestling company popping Chavo into his, uh, in his, into his cab and off he went. Uh, I guess they had called the cab and it was time for Chavo to get to his hotel. And I was like, no, no, oh. Chavo, the beer's bro. Oh, no, oh, well. <laughs> I hate that, man. I hate that, you know. Uh, yeah, he must, not, he must not have seen you because... Uh, no, he didn't. Not the car was already moving as so I was like, no, but you know, one day I hope to have Chavo on the show too. And I'm going to make sure that he has a Corona on him and I'm going to have a Corona and we can finally have that beer together. <laughs> you get to have this moment that never happened. Yeah. Chavo is a great guy. I'll say about Chavo very quickly too. You talk about a nice guy to such an extent. There are a lot of guys in the wrestling business that can have a short fuse and, and I've seen it and I've been around it. So I can certainly understand when people go uh, head to head and get a little friction, Chavo is one of those kind of guys. If you've got a problem with Chavo, you're probably the person that's the issue and not Chavo. Cause it takes a lot to, to get him kind of riled up that way. Uh, in fact, I'm one of the most patient one of the least aggressive people in the world, but we had a match one time where we're going to the ring and Chavo would wear that uh, bandana on his head. And, a fan reached over 
and snatched the bandana off him. Oh, well, I didn't realize right. he was just trying to as a souvenir. I just thought he was grabbing Chavo. All I saw was Chavo's head going. And I turned around and popped him. I popped the guy and dropped him. And uh, just because you touch the wrestlers like that in an aggressive way, yeah. you know, all bets are off and we've got to protect us. And I could, I got called into the uh, to the office the next week in the legal department. They asked for my, my story of what happened, that somebody was going to try to sue WCW. And I basically related the same thing I told you. And they go, yeah, that's the way we saw it, too. And they showed the tape and they actually had the footage of me uh, kind of taking up for Chavo and that. And they said, this is not going to be an issue at all. But uh, Chavo, because of that, that kind of solidified the bonding we already had for Chavo. <laughs> knew he could depend on me to always have his back. <laughs> Absolutely, bro. That's a great story. Um, okay, next up, he was known as Van Hammer. Then he was known as Private Stash, but apparently he wasn't very happy with his ranking. So he complained. So it became Major Stash. Uh, I know he's ha he's had some problems lately and... Uh, and all that, but do you have any uh, memories of Van Hammer? Van Hammer was an outlier, and, and what I mean by that is this. Me, Chavo, and Hugh were three guys that we were brothers, and we were traveling together even before there was ever a business action. We were already close. You know, there were certain guys that you gravitate to in this business. You're around the business at all. You know that, uh, that are like-minded people, and just kind of you, you, you share a, a commonality there that you're the same type of person. The three of us were already extremely close. And Van Hammer got thrown in that mix for some of the same reasons like I mentioned before. They just thought, this is a big guy. He would be the good muscle for the, the quiet muscle part of the group. And he'd be good to have, for them to have in the mix. And he's talented. We don't want to just send him home. We'll stick him with the misfits in action. And right away, that kind of stuff started happening, which was, well, I'm not happy with private stash. Okay, you don't get the joke. The joke is it's a private stash. Exactly, because you know? he's his character the whole time has been the guy that smokes weed and is about peace, baby. So, of course, right. pri it's private stash. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But instead of seeing that, he saw it again as his ranking, quote, unquote, <laughs> in the group. And he was also the kind of guy that would – he would go behind our back and he would go and sit down with someone like uh, Ed Ferreira or Vince and say, okay, I'm, if you guys want to do this, by the way, this is at the very, very beginning, but if we're going to do this, uh, we, we've got to go ahead and start talking about action figures and merchandising and t-shirt designs and everything else. And you got, brother, you're kind of putting the cart before the horse a little bit, you know? And, and so we saw him as a little bit of a heat seeker. We liked him personally. We just saw him as a heat seeker that was, didn't reflect the mentality and the attitude towards the business that the rest of us had. The rest of our attitude towards the business was, okay, give us a shot. Let us show our talent. And if we prove ourselves, then now we have a reason for us to go forward with all these other things. Yeah. You don't go in and start demands ahead of time. And because of that, we just, it, it rubbed us the wrong way. And that's the only time in my wrestling career that I can ever say that I was guilty of uh, going along with, with Hugh and Chavo and saying, when, when they said, okay, we're going to go to the bookers and sort of politic a little bit to kind of get rid of, 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 of Van Hammer and bringing in somebody else in that spot. Uh, that would be the one time in my career where I agreed with that. Now I wasn't doing anything nefarious. And I would never say anything behind somebody's back that I wouldn't say to their face, but I, I will freely admit that we said, this is not a good fit. Van Hammer, he's just not, it's not going to be good chemistry and it's not going to work in the long run. And, yeah. and he was just as happy as we were, I think. I don't think he really wanted to be a part of the group. Right. Yeah. And, and look, I, I'm a fan of Van Hammer, but it always seemed like, and I've had many people on the show talk about him a little bit here and there. It always seemed like he shot himself in the foot here and there um, with some yeah. of his antics. But uh, second last person in the group that I wanted to ask about, the Wall, a.k.a. Sergeant A. Wall. Uh, what a great name to, to give him because, you know, it plays off on the wall very well. May he rest in peace. Uh, please tell me, what are your fondest memories of the big man himself? That he was the gentle giant. And again, he was everything Van Hammer wasn't. And I don't mean that as a knock to, to Van Hammer. They were just different mentalities. They came from different positions. They were cut from different cloths. Jerry was far more like we were. You know, he, he had a good heart. He had a heart for the business. He was very unselfish. 
He was about getting everybody over, just getting himself over. And we said, you know what? You want to put a big guy with us? You want some quiet muscle as part of the group? Make him the quiet muscle as part of the group because we yeah. get along with him. He's one of them. Let, let's let's bring him in. And and he, he shared that sort of uh, northeast Jersey connection type thing with Hugh that, that Hugh had too. And so I think they had some water under the bridge from, from previous years together. And it, that was, that was the missing puzzle piece. And that was a good fit where hammer just wasn't a good fit. He was hammer was trying to stick a square peg into a round hole. Jerry was just another piece of the puzzle that, that brought the whole picture together. And uh, man, what a phenomenally talented guy. And man, he could move for a big guy. He was just a sweet, genuinely kind person. Absolutely. I remember very little side note, as a matter of fact, you talk about how big he really was and how strong he actually was. We were having a match and uh, three count was involved in the match. And we're doing a little smalls outside the ring, you know, and me and Sugar Shane, uh, Hurricane Helms were, were outside the ring and we're kind of going back and forth a little bit. And Jerry just re- Jerry is standing on the apron. A wall is standing on the apron and he just reaches down and palms his head and picks him up by his head with one hand. Right? <laughs> just phenomenal. The guy was a beast. Wow. And it was good for him to get out of that suit and that, that tie and, and white shirt to to finally like evolve as a character because he'd been away from uh, Alex Wright for a while there and it was time for him to get away from that look and do something different. So it's a good evolution for him. And the last one, be still my beating heart, Major Guns. Yeah. Nice, sweet, sweet girl that they, they put with us that was just meant to be the eye candy. And she was the eye candy, you know. Um, uh, again, she was, she was willing to do whatever they asked her to do. And, and she was happy to be a part of the group. And uh, she did a really good job of, of listening to us. You know, I'll give her this compliment. I'll give her this compliment. Uh, if you are a girl in that type of situation, if you're a lady in that type where you don't really have a wrestling background and they're bringing you in to, to be the eye candy aspect of the group and they're bringing you in to, uh, to balance things out from that standpoint, the worst thing that you can do is to only be eye candy and say, my job is to look good all the time and try to get myself over. That's the worst thing you can do. And a lot of women do that in wrestling. What she did do that I give her a lot of credit for is she was extremely coachable, extremely coachable. She'd listen to whatever we asked her to do. If we told her this will get over, that won't get over, then she was more than willing to do that. And, and I always uh, appreciated that aspect about her. Um, and, and she would listen to us. They'd come up with an idea, and we would try to take it to the next level. And they were pretty cool about that. Like uh, Ed Ferreira, I think, was the one that came to us and, and said, we're going to do the deal where we'll knock somebody out or somebody gets knocked out or whenever there's someone unconscious in the match, she's going to come in and she's going to give them mouth-to-mouth resuscitation, right? <laughs> we said, well, what if we give her, give her a wife beater, you know, and she rips the shirt off. Hulk Hogan style, and then does mouth to mouth, and Amazing. then I took it to the next level. I always took the sharpie with me because of my artwork and my drawing and stuff. I always had mar- markers on me, drawing things on me, and I started just writing on the uh, t-shirts on the wife beaters with a sharpie before every show. Bombs away, so it looked stenciled, almost military style, across it, and uh, and that got over to such an extent that WCW. We just showed up one week and they had started printing them, so they had. <laughs> They had printed bombs away wife beaters for her to wear. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah. And another side note, I'll tell you really quick before we wrap up the whole Miss Miss and Action Hell. Uh, another place where I was allowed to let my artistic aspect shine when they finally did t shirts for us. I designed that t shirt. I drew that Misfits in Action logo, that MIA logo strictly from uh from uh, from scratch and I came up with that and it had kind of a tribal uh, design behind the actual seal that said MIA on it and later on when Chavo broke away from the group and started doing singles again I took just the tribal design itself that I had utilized behind that and that became Chavo's sort of design that he used on his tights oh, and the okay. last time I saw him wrestle he had the same design Wow, unbelievable. 
That's great, Pro. Well, thank you for that. And uh, yeah, I just, uh, she was a ratings winner, that's for sure. Like uh, anytime <laughs> she was on TV, I'm ready and waiting for her to go boom. Um, <laughs> okay, let's move a little bit forward. You guys have a great run together. You feud with uh, the Filthy Animals, the Natural Brawn Thrillers. You also feud with Team Canada. Um, but here we go. You're in Australia the 7th of October, 2000, at the Entertainment Centre in Sydney. You and Chavo win the WCW World Tag Team Championships for only a few minutes before uh, dropping them back to uh, Mark Jindrak and Sean O'Hare. Tell me a little bit about that and your experience in Australia. Loved Australia. Absolutely loved Australia. One of the top places I've ever been in my life. And I'm not just saying that to blow smoke because you and I are talking. I've said this in other interviews many of times i was i loved australia a surprising amount and i think a lot of it's because i'm an old southern boy here in the, here in the states you know and for me we when we did that tour in australia we had done about 16 days i think like in in, in england they came home like a week in australia for like 20 something days and the the dichotomy, the difference there, the contrast between going to the East and then going to Australia was about like the difference between going up <laughs> north here in the United States and then coming down south. You know, <laughs> it, it's like you go up and people are a little a little rude and a little snarky and they can be a little sarcastic. And then you come down to the south and you don't meet somebody that's not your friend. You know, you can't stand in line at a Walmart without having a 15 minute conversation with a stranger. And it was the same thing in Australia. You know, uh, we, we went to England and there were times in England where I honestly felt like they were still mad that they, we won the war because, <laughs> they, they, you know, it, sometimes they come off rude for no reason at all. And, and they don't mean to be. It's just that's the kind of cloth they're cut out of. And we come down to Australia. I can remember driving in, in Australia to the, to the show and the guy that would, would drive the bus with the wrestlers from the hotel to the show would literally drive like this. He's driving this huge bus. He's looking over his shoulder, talking to us the entire time and having a conversation. And the, <laughs> this is great. But maybe it's your faith. He said, oh. no, it was, <laughs> it was phenomenal. And it was like, everybody was your friend. Everybody was your buddy. And it was such a beautiful country. I, I've always said, if I had to live somewhere outside the United States, it would be Australia. Awesome, it's right. a beautiful place to be. That's great, man. You know, and, and and what was devastating for me back then was the Perth show got cancelled. I my mum bought me tickets and we were gonna go to the show together, but the show in our city got cancelled. But I'm glad that you you had fond memories of Australia. Did it feel good to win the tag team titles for a couple of minutes there? It feels better now. And the reason why <laughs> I say that is this is, uh, again, the reason why I said what I said earlier about I've never really been a belt mark when it comes to myself. Um, the reason why, I think that's a perfect example of it. And, and what I mean by that is, I get to look back and say that I've been a WCW tag team champion, which is no small thing. It's nothing to sniff at. And I, and I get that and I appreciate that. And I'm grateful that I've had that moment in my career and I've had that marker that I can mention that. But here's the honest truth, y'all. I'm 100% honest with you, brutally honest. I didn't know we, we didn't know we were going to win the titles till we got there that night and they decided to book the finish that way. So for us, it was just another finish to a match. And, and as soon as we win it, it's not like we're taking photos with it or carrying it home and, and showing it to my nephew, you know, it's, it's, we, we win them and then we turn right around and we lose them again. And the flip <laughs> side is, so that happens so quickly and it happens that night and it's a blur because you don't even know what's going to happen ahead of time. You don't really even have time to enjoy it before you're turning them back over to somebody else. The flip side of that is, you know, we do a lot of house shows here in the United States. And I remember in WCW, I did a house show once and I, I believe it was Ray, Ray Mysterio Jr. I wrestled Ray Mysterio Jr. Won the cruiserweight title and dropped it a couple of nights later at a different house show. And we only did it just to be different, but because it was never televised, it never happened in wrestling. Really? No more. <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> to be the WCW Cruiserweight Champion, even though I was, be, you know, for that reason. So, that again, that's the reason why I never put a lot of, of, of stock into it. I, it would probably be a lot bigger deal if we came from the era that was pre-K-Fabe. 
or, or yeah, yeah. And now that we're we're post kayfabe, and 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 uh, you know, if we were still in the era of kayfabe, rather is a better way of saying it, as opposed to post kayfabe where everybody knows everything now and you can just look it up on the internet and that sort of thing. And you kind of know what the fish is. Um, and I don't want to wax philosophical on professional wrestling at large, but that's one of the reasons why it has lost a small element of the mystique and magic it once had is because as a wrestling fan, how can you really dig deep emotionally into a match when in the back of your mind, you know, it really doesn't matter who the champion comes out be because the champion is whoever they decide they want it to be tonight. You know, That's that true. that loses some luster and some of the magic, I think. And, and why we do that as a wrestling business, I don't understand, you know. And that, that's a whole different podcast, I'm sure. But that's something that bothers me more than anything else. Not because I think we should treat fans as if they're ignorant. We can't do that, obviously. And you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. But by the same token, I go to if I go to Las Vegas and I see a phenomenal magic show, you don't have to explain to me how David Blaine is not a real magician. I know magic's not real, yeah. but I don't want you to <laughs> do the show, me think that this is a phenomenal show and clap, and then at the end of it go, okay, now we're going to show you how it was all done. No, don't ruin it for me. No. Just let me experience it, and however I feel about it afterwards is how I feel about it afterwards. <laughs> well, I'm glad to at least like, as a fan know that you actually did become cruiserweight champion, even if it wasn't official. <laughs> yeah, um, my official my record books. <laughs> okay, we're coming full circle with something that you mentioned earlier in the show. And there's not many more questions left, Lash. I'm, I'm sorry if I've taken up a lot of your time, but uh, February, February 17th, Nitro in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, you take on Rick Steiner for the US title. It's just under a month from the final Nitro. So just over a month from the final Nitro. Why weren't you on television during the time of February 17th until uh, March 26th, I believe? It's a tremendous story. And it's also ties into the great lore and insight that is that whole transition period of professional wrestling. And it's my little small uh, segment of it, my little nugget, if you will, of, of what went on during that time. And it kind of speaks to how it went for everybody on a larger scale. By that point in WCW, the writing level was Eric Bischoff was going to buy the company. Uh, it was almost a foregone conclusion among those that were in the know that Eric was putting together a deal with some backers and some business guys. He was going to come in, he was going to buy WCW, and he was going to be the owner. Not just come back as a president, but he's going to come back in and he's going to be the Vince McMahon of WCW at that point. And it was such a foregone conclusion that he's calling the shots in the back. You know, Eric is at the shows. And if he says something or, or makes a suggestion, you're going to listen to him because you're expecting him to be your boss in just a few short weeks as soon as they get this deal done. Now, the reason why that deal fell through, according to my understanding, now, I certainly wasn't privy to all this, but my understanding is that once Turner, for whatever reason, decided to start pulling our TV deals and our TV time and our TV programming, once they started pulling all of that, well, now the company itself has lost value because what good is a wrestling company if you don't have television programming for it, right? And so that caused Eric's deal to fall apart at the last minute, and he wasn't able to purchase WCW because they didn't have the same value it would have had otherwise with the TV deals. And now you can make all kinds of arguments for why that was stupid on Turner's part and why you would do that and devalue a company you're trying to dump. I don't know, but that's all very kabuki-ish. But suffice to say that Eric was considered the person that was going to buy the company and run with it. So we're at that show that you just mentioned. I think you said it was a Hawks format. That's how I remember it. I think that was right. Um, and we're on stage, and Eric walks by me. And again, um, at this point, I've never really had a long conversation with Eric. We've always been cordial and nice to each other. And I've always said hi to him and been respectful and, and was happy to be working for him. But I wasn't a – I wasn't – a big enough blip blip on his radar that he's pulling me aside and having personal conversations with me, right? So we walk by each other in the hall, and Eric just pauses, and he looks at me, he goes, cut your hair, it looks stupid, and just keeps walking. And 
I kind of had the same reaction that you just showed there too. You know, I sort of saw that. Went, where did that come from? That was he goes, cut your hair, it looks goofy, or it looks stupid, or something to that effect. And to his credit, to his credit, about. 45 minutes later, an hour later, he comes back to me and says, man, I didn't mean it the way that that probably came out. He goes, here's what I think. He goes, your hair is really long and it's floppy and it's curly. And it, to me, it just looked kind of goofy in the ring, the way it's all over the place. Now, my mentality was everybody was starting to cut their hair and it was looking short. So why would I want to look like everybody else? Because yeah. at that time, everybody kind of had that John Stasek haircut for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why, but they did. And uh, and they were cutting their hair. I thought, you know, I want to stand out. I want to look different. But, hey, if Eric's going to be the boss and he wants me to cut my hair, I'll cut my hair. But anyway, he comes to me and he says, would like for you to cut your hair? He goes, here's what I want to do tonight. He had felt like during Vince Russo's tenure, you mentioned it earlier, that Russo came in and wanted to really push the young guys and these young, talented guys. And the guys that had been around for a while, not only they get pushed to the side a little bit, but the ones that kind of still got used, got used in a way that diminished their credibility as just old school, tough guy wrestlers. And one of those was Rick Steiner. You know, they had felt that they had turned Rick Steiner into a little bit of a joke. Um, he had been used as sort of a stepping stone for Scott Steiner to build Scotty up to be big Papa Pomp. While at the same time, he had sort of a fizzling uh, angle with Tank Abbott that probably yeah. didn't do as much as he expected it to do. Yeah. Um, then I think that he did a couple of other things that I think they perceived as being goofy and not being fitting his character. I do know that Rick was really dissatisfied with how they used him, too. And Eric was a big proponent of Rick's. He should have been. Rick was a bona fide star, a phenomenal talent. And and Eric said that they wanted to build him back up as a monster, give him some credibility that he could really just be that guy that goes out and kills his opponents, you know, kind of road warrior style. So Eric, what he came to me and pitched to me personally that night was, we want you to have a match with Rick. Let him just destroy you, annihilate you in a few minutes, make him look like a monster again so that he can build his credibility back up. And that'll give you an excuse to have to be sent home to recover, you know, the old school, I've got to be, I got to go home for a while. And, and, to, and, and in his defense, he's not wrong about this. You know, when we were in the MIA, I got to wear a T-shirt while I was. So I got a little pudgy, got a little heavy. And he said, uh, go home, lean down, come back as a strict cruiserweight again, have your hair cut with a new look, be lean, be leaner. We'll put the cruiserweight title on you, and I'll give you a little bit of a run with the cruiserweight title. So that was what he pitched to me that night. To my face from Eric Bischoff, which I get a huge comment, maybe more than happy to go out and do what they asked me to do. And went out, had the match with Rick. They carry out and do the ambulance gimmick, you know, where they put me on the gurney and they put me in the ambulance and do that whole deal. And I go home. And while I'm at home during that four week layoff, is uh, when they sold the company and they had the, the famous Nitro where Vince is now the owner. Vince McMahon is now the owner. Of course. And look, you, you had mentioned this thing about Eric wanting to, you know, continue, well, he was going to be continuing WCW before he found out that the television deals were no longer going to be on the table. This, this, this edition of WCW magazine that I showed a comic of with you, this is actually uh -huh. one that was printed for April of 2001. So the company was already gone by the time that this had come out. And on the back of the magazine, the Big Bang. Oh, wow. May 6, 2001. This is on the back of that magazine. So, And your cartoon is in this magazine. But I thought that that was really important to, to show because your cartoon's in the magazine. The company's gone by the time that this comes out. But another thing that I found interesting was that this one here is from May of 2001 with DDP on the cover the, co the, the company's been gone now for two months, and this was the last edition of the magazine, I believe. Um, but I, I just thought it was uh, interesting to, to show that the magazine was still coming out, even though WCW was no longer uh, around. But, well, um, Carl, the reason why that's important is it also shows you too, man, the, the uncertainty around everything that was going on at the time. Those are the yeah. things that I kind of missed is this is nobody really knew what they were going to do with what. 
They didn't know what they were doing and why. And, and part of the reason why is you had this big merger that was going on at the time between AOL and Time Warner. And that was where all of the energy was going. And WCW, for, for, for all of its credibility, a big wrestling company, and the overall corporate structure of things, it was thought of as an after, afterthought. You know, and that's the reason why it wasn't given probably the tip that it deserved. And nobody was in a position to make kind of decisions that needed to be made to to have some vision going forward. And so what winds up happening is the people that are left behind that are still collecting a paycheck are just trying to make the trades run on time. <laughs> that's it, bro. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting to say is that, okay, your match with Steiner, Rick Steiner. And you know what? When you alluded to before about Rick Steiner during the Vince Russo era, I completely agree that that was one guy that did not get given anything that he deserved during that time. I really like what Vince did with a lot of the younger guys, but I felt like Rick Steiner really was forgotten about. Scott was looked after quite well, but I thought Rick wasn't looked after very well. Um, but one thing I thought was interesting, you had that match on February 17th, but I think what might be your last actual televised appearance for WCW was on February 24th for WCW Worldwide, which I'm sure was already recorded before the fact. For Ask WCW, you sat there with Scott Hudson. He had this stupid jester's hat on his head when he's talking to you, but you're talking to you about uh, a, a fan asking you a question about having your teeth knocked out uh, and alluding back to the video game and all that, WCW Mayhem the game, you had your teeth knocked out apparently. So for those out there who haven't seen that clip and don't know the story, could you please refresh us? Yeah, absolutely, man. Is uh, my, my front teeth all the way up to the gum line were broken and, and just annihilated and what was left was very, very, very tiny. It was just hanging out by the roots. And what had happened was we mentioned earlier in the interview of my first break being with the sports up in Vancouver doing the video game. The, the last day that we were there uh, doing any kind of a taping at all. And of course, everything always happens on the last day. <laughs> this is the last day. <laughs> last day we're in Vancouver. And uh, they asked me, they came to me and said, we would like to record some things for sound. Do you mind if we record things for sound? And I said, sure, absolutely, whatever you guys need. It was kind of a laid back day. It was a Sunday. I'll never forget. It was a Sunday. And uh, they wired up with all these, the, the normal stuff that I would wear that they could film. And then they put like a wrestling headgear on me. So they could put little microphones all over it. They got microphones all over me. And they've got boom mics everywhere. And the last thing they asked me to do is would I come off the top rope to the outside through a table and they get sound of that. I go, sure. That's not a problem at all. Yeah. I've, I've gone through tables. What's the big deal? Yeah. I'll do that. Not, not a big deal at all. Well, what I didn't know it to in their defense, they didn't recognize the danger of this. They didn't see anything wrong with it, but they wanted it to be as loud as possible. They wanted this to be noisy and, and sound like a real impact for the game. And they went to their prop room. And remember, these are guys that do all kinds of video games. So they've got, you can imagine the props that they have in their prop room. And they come out and anything that they thought would be loud, garbage can lids, everything else, they put under the table. So I don't know what's there because it's all under the table. And I'm just going through a table. Well, I come off the top rope, I go through the table. And when I hit through the table and I land just doing a basic splash, I break through the table on top of everything else that is loud that I've hit is a car door. So this, this sandwich of noise that they have made, the bread on top of the sandwich of noise is just a random car door. And so I go through the table, my face hits the car door. And right away, I know, that, okay, this is bad. I've knocked my teeth out because I don't have them on my face. My lips were not busted. There was not a scratch on me anywhere. My teeth were just gone, my two front oh. teeth. And uh, my heart just sank, man. And, and they freaked out. You know, they're, I'm sure the first thing went to their mind is the lawsuit because they hit some big red button like this is some sci-fi movie and they locked the place down. There was no getting out or getting in, right? <laughs> and they, they make some calls and it's uh, socialized medicine up there, right? So they call in some special dentist to come in and open up her, her, uh, 
her office that day just for me. They load me into a limousine. I don't know if they thought maybe I'd feel better about things if I went there in a limousine. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so they, they load me into a limousine, and they take me to this dentist's office, and she works on my mouth for like three hours. What's left of my teeth, she has to push back up into the, the gum line. And so it's broken to such a point that there is nothing, there's almost nothing hanging outside of the gum line. They have to do a double root canal. I didn't even realize you could do a root canal in your front teeth. They do a double root canal. Then they come in and they start bonding them up. And when she's done doing this bonding job, keep in mind, I've always had this gap between my teeth. Um, in fact, a funny side note is I once had someone tell me that they thought the first time they saw me that I had surgically had that gap put in my teeth so I'd look even more Cajun. I don't know <laughs> where that comes from, <laughs> but that was actually told to me once. And so anyway, she 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 bonds my teeth back up. She does this, uh, this cosmetic work on me. She gets done finally after three hours. She hands me a mirror, and I look in the mirror. I don't know if this is a thing in Australia or if you've ever seen these before. But here in the United States, just like you can buy fangs around uh, Halloween, they're the plastic fangs that you put in like a mouthpiece and it looks like you have vampire teeth. They make these Bubba teeth is what they call them here. They just look like redneck snaggle tooth, one tooth <laughs> yeah. smaller than the other, bigger <laughs> sticking out just to make you look goofy, you know, type of teeth. That's what I look like. Like <laughs> one tooth than the other, and they stuck out at weird angles. And I remember my heart just sunk and I'm sitting there and I'm going, this is not what I looked like before. You got to be kidding me. I've got TV. I'm going to be on TV in two days. I can't go to a TV tape, you know, with my mouth looking like this. And she looks at me. She goes, I, I don't know what else to do. All I've got is the space to work with. I have no idea what she looked like before because she had never met me, which is fair. And she goes, if you have a photo or something I could go by, then I'll look at the photo and maybe we can fix this and we can make it better. And I'm going, well, I got my I got my driver's license. I pull out my ID and my driver's license. Nobody smiles in their ID. So you can't see my teeth in the ID. And then I get my promo picture. You really can't see my teeth in promo picture. This is pre-cell phone where everybody's got a million selfies of themselves on their phone. So I don't have a cell phone with a bunch of pictures on it that she can just look at the pictures. And I'm just sitting there stewing and stewing and getting more and more upset and more and more upset and just thinking I'm stuck looking like this. <laughs> and then it's like, hey, you got a piece of print pencil. She goes, yeah. So she brings it in and I draw what my teeth looked like before. <laughs> I just do this drawing of what my mouth should look like. And she goes by the drawing and fixes my teeth that way. And <laughs> all is well. <laughs> amazing amazing i just wanted to have that story retold here and not just be on an old edition of wcw worldwide um okay so tell me about when you found out that the wwf bought wcw and let me know were you at the final wcw monday nitro uh and also finding out that the wwf picked up your contract Okay. Well, uh, first of all, Carl, when did you find out that WCW got sold? Uh, I think uh, back in the day, I must have been looking on like uh, wrestling news websites and it would have been like not very long before that edition of Monday Night Raw. Because at the time, Nitro was no longer airing in Australia for some reason. Oh, okay. Um, okay. We had a service called Foxtel that you had to pay for and uh, it used to be on TNT, which also played old movies, but Nitro was no longer on, on there anymore. But anyway, um, I found out like maybe like the day before and I was like, just couldn't believe it. Couldn't they, believe it. Okay, I found out before I did. <laughs> because I found out when all the wrestling fans found out, I found out when a lot of the wrestlers found out, that even the guys that were at the show, didn't know it was sold until Shane McMahon showed up in limousine. I must and, have, uh, um, I must have, uh, I don't know if they aired it on a delay. I think maybe it was a few days delay in Australia when it would air in, in Australia. So that's probably why I found out beforehand. You talk about doing a good job of educating everybody on that is, is uh, 
I found out if you were at that show, you found out watching the show, like all the wrestling fans did. And I wasn't at that show because of what we just talked about a second ago, where they, they sent me home and I was training and, and, and I was training hard and losing weight and, 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 and felt like I was looking good and in great shape. And now watching the show, and I'm like, what in the world am I watching? You know, just a strange, very surreal moment. And I'm trying to, I'm about doing this, but we're all, each other and i think this is before texting was really in vogue you know it was probably a thing but nobody really texted each other back then tried to call people and nobody was really taking my calls and nobody was calling me back and i think it was two or three days later before i started talking to other wrestlers like you and getting their take on it and stuff and and i remember them telling me that they didn't know until they realized Shane was limousine and walking to the front you know, and they thought, well, this isn't good. You know, Shane McMahon is here. And so that's how I found out. And then it was maybe I was in limbo for about a week, a week and a half, maybe two weeks before uh, Johnny Ace, Johnny Laurinaitis called me. John Laurinaitis, who had been by that point, it come to the top relations for WCW and was kind of the, the go-to guy when it came to the talent. And, uh, he was the working the transition there for Vince hand in hand with Jim Ross at that point with Jr. and kind of helping them as they're acquiring talent. So he was making a lot of these calls. He was sort of the liaison to the WCW talent. And Johnny called me up and, hey, Lash, yeah, I got good news and I got bad news. Okay, what's the good news? And what's the bad news, Johnny? Give me the bad news first. The bad news is. This is only interesting. 24 guys from WCW. Okay, what's the news? You're one of them. <laughs> Great. What do I need to do? Just in time, I'll get back with you in a couple of weeks. So that's how I found out. And then he called me back a couple of weeks later, update me even more, and we just went from there. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And I really appreciated your uh, John Moranis uh, impression there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. hey, 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 Lash. Uh, yeah, brilliant. Um, so, okay. When he called back. Uh, you, you go to Heartland Wrestling with Les Thatcher um, once you find out that your contract's picked up. Um I, wa I, I just wanted to know what your experience was like there. Um, I know you know you made your debut debut sorry on August thirtieth. This is from my research in Kentucky, Covington, Kentucky, with Johnny the Bull and Kiwi, aka Alan Funk, against Rest in Peace, uh, the Island Boys, Umaga and Rosie, as they would know be known as later on, and Steve Bradley. All three of them, Rest in Peace. Um, but please. Tell me a little bit about what it was like walking in there. You, you go from WCW and being on pay-per-view and being in Misfits in Action and you take this loss to Rick Steiner and you're off TV for a while. You, you, you've hit such a pinnacle it, in the Monday Night Wars to be on a roster of one of those two big companies is a massive accomplishment. And you go from there, and we talked about this with Alan Funk about how he was on WCW Greed and it was like the last pay-per-view and he was really starting to get somewhere. And now all of a sudden you are back in a developmental company and a territory. How did that make you feel? And, and tell me about just the Heartland Wrestling experience. Well, without, without keeping the company as a whole, because I don't, I don't blame anybody in particular for this. And I have no bitterness or no ill will towards anyone, but it was without a doubt the low point of my wrestling career. And the reason why it was low point in my wrestling career, I appreciate the way that you framed that, Carl, because it, I don't consider myself some legendary big superstar wrestler by any stretch of the imagination at all. I'm not that big of a mark for myself. But at the same token, it's no small thing the, what I accomplished in WCW and what I was able to do in the level that I was at. And I felt like I was performing at a very high level and the way things played out for me. And I can only speak to my own personal experience on this. And the way that it played out for me was this. So I got Johnny Ace calling me up and going, Hey, Lash, 
there's only interested in 24 guys. You're one of them. Well, you're talking about a roster of maybe about 160. Now, those guys aren't all being used on a regular basis, but you know, that's a that's already what you just said, a very exclusive roster. And now you've narrowed it down to made it even more exclusive. Only 24 guys out of all of those. So one of the talented guys that Vince wants to have on the team. And so I said, okay, what do I need to do? Johnny goes, sit tight. We'll get back with you a couple of weeks. Well, he calls me back in a couple of weeks. And at this time, my contract in WCW is about to roll over to the final year. And I'm finally seeing monetarily, just to talk a little bit about how the sausage gets made, I'm finally monetarily seeing some of the fruits of how hard I have worked up until this point, right? And so as a result of that, it's about to roll over to me making some significant money for the first time in my career. Uh, when I say significant money, I just mean, you know, something more than what you're just going to make just being a professional out here in the regular workforce. You're going to actually uh, do, do pretty well for yourself. And, and I was proud of that. I was happy about that. And, and he said to me, he goes, uh, he calls me up the Friday before the Monday that my contract is to roll over. And they asked me to take a pay cut and sign a WWE style contract, WWF at the time style contract. And uh, which I was totally cool with. I kind of felt like that was probably going to come anyway at some point. I was surprised that they had not asked me to sign one yet and that they were just writing out my WCW contract. So that didn't necessarily didn't surprise me, but here's the way that they sold it to me. They said, you need to understand WCW had these guaranteed contracts. Now, if you were a guy, unless you were a very, very top guy like Kevin Nash or Hulk Hogan or Steen, you got that guaranteed money. And the only extra money you got on top of that WCW was was video game, you know, money or residuals for T-shirt sales or something like that. Right. Your, your merchandising money, rather, is what yeah. I mean to say. And uh, WWE, their style contracts were much less on the downside, but you got residuals off of every WWE show that you did, you would get a draw off of that, you know, and if you did a pay-per-view, you know, depending on where you were on that pay-per-view card, you're going to get a big fat check for that particular show. CTW, all those pay-per-views I did, I never got an extra free of that stuff. It was all considered part of my contract, which is right. absolutely fine. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying it was two different ways of doing business. Well, the way that it was sold to me is they wanted me to take a $100,000 pay cut to go to WWF. So I'm taking a hundred thousand dollar pay cut, but, but here's what, here's the big, here's the big part of it. He said, look, you are a workhorse in WCW. You are a guy we could count on. All that's true. So I got no reason to feel like anybody's going to smoke. Up. You know, he goes, you are a workhorse in WCW. You were on the road 300 days out of the year. If you work like that in WWE, you're going to make more money at the end of the year. So it'll be far more than what your WCW contract was anyway. And I thought, well, that makes sense. I mean, it certainly makes sense. So I take this huge pay cut. A week after I sign the new contract, I get another call from Johnny Ace. It is, uh, hey, Lash, Vince wants you to go to Cincinnati for about four weeks to knock the ring rust off before they're ready to bring you out on TV. And my understanding at that point was that, hey, they dug the kicker, they dug my work ability, my talent, and uh, they weren't really going to change anything about me. They just wanted to buy a little time to write me into some storylines or whatever they wanted to do with me to kind of figure things out. That made sense to me. No big deal. Well, the way contracts work in wrestling uh, from a travel standpoint is they buy your airline tickets unless you have some kind of special rider. They'll, they'll buy your airline tickets and you pay for your own room and you pay for your own rental car. And anything over 300 miles, they fly you. Anything under 300 miles, you drive. So uh, when they told me that, you know, Cincinnati was about eight hours away from drive time. So uh, I said, okay, well, you're going to send me an a airline ticket. Well, I fly into Cincinnati. And, and Johnny said to me, he goes, you know, you probably want to drive up there so that you have your own personal vehicle. And that way you're not losing a lot of money on a rental car. I said, okay, well, I guess that kind of makes sense. All right, sure, I can do that. Not a big deal if you drive up there. And you need to report by Monday. So I find out on Friday I need to be there by Monday. So I've been up to Cincinnati for four weeks. 
And uh, keep in mind, the one smart thing that I did do, Carl, by the way, is some of those guys from WCW, and I don't know what Allen's situation was and what some of these other guys were, but they went into it with a little bit clearer eye because when Vince signed them, they signed trainee contracts. I signed a talent contract. Right. And so I signed a talent contract. In my mind, I was just transitioning from being talent in WCW to being talent in WWE. I wasn't going backwards, and I wasn't becoming a trainee. I wasn't going to developmental. They never sold it to me like that. They just sold it to me like, you know, the same way you would have a guy that would get injured in the ring and have to go and work off an injury and get back in ring shape before he comes back. That's all I thought I was doing. Well, I drive up there and I get to Cincinnati and I'm thinking I'm going to be there about four weeks. Four weeks turned into nine months. <laughs> nine months. And while I'm there, I'm also being asked to drive from, from uh, Hart to OVW in Louisville and drive back and forth and do their TV tapings too, help train some of those guys. And I'm on the, and I'm up there from Sundays. No, uh, a typical week for me was you start training on Monday and you'd have shows on Tuesdays, I think it was, and you'd have a show um, on Saturday. So I think it was Saturday and Tuesdays and sometimes Sunday at OVW if they ask you to come to OVW. And I think that's right, something like that. I may be, I may be off on that. It's been a while. And that's, that's also something I've tried to put a mental block on. No. But, uh, <laughs> but really a typical week for me, though, was this. I would – I would train guys and train with guys Monday through Thursday. Thursday we'd train in the morning about two o'clock in the afternoon, four o'clock in the afternoon. I'd throw all my gear and my laundry in the back of my car and I'd drive the eight and a half hours back home to Alabama so that I'd get in about three o'clock in the morning on Friday morning to spend some time with my wife on Friday. And then I'd leave on Saturday morning at six o'clock to get back to Cincinnati for a show on Saturday night that I'm not getting paid for because these are not considered WWE shows. Oh my They're gosh. just considered part of it. So I'm making less money than I made in WCW and I'm on the road more and it's not even on the same level and I'm not making them any money. I'm not making the money that was promised to me. And man, that just keeps lasting, keep lasting and I don't spend any time at all. There's to be no end in sight. And man, it, I, I'll just read the wall. I just, you know, I look back and I see they had a lot of talent and they had, they had probably more guys that they knew how to utilize or use. And so it would be wrong for me to be bitter or resentful towards anyone in, individually for that. But man, it was a bad situation. I won't lie about it. And yeah, you know, that it, it didn't end well. Yeah. Well, I mean, wow. I mean, there's a, there's a hell of a whirlwind of a story there because I mean, uh, when we interviewed Alan Funk, he told me very similar stuff about how the WCW talent were traded uh, during that time. And I got, I remember getting real upset about it. And I, I, I went on a bit of a rant about it because, you know, he had said, you know, all this time, it felt like that they had brought all of us WCW guys in to help their current developmental guys get better. And then once that was over, and all the guys are screaming for a dark match. The only one who did get one was Johnny the Bull Stamboli, and he got to right. wrestle RVD, and apparently it was a barn burner. So he gets given yep. a chance later down the line. But I want to I want to name a bunch of guys that, from my research, were there, and from what Alan had mentioned, was there. Uh, yourself, Alan, Jamie Noble, Jason Jett, aka Easy Money, Shannon Moore. Mm -hmm. Elix Skipper, Rick Cornell, a.k.a. Reno. I believe Dave yep. Taylor was there. Brian Adams had come down after the chronic thing didn't work out, which you can find out that full story with my interview with Brian Clark that's coming up very soon. Uh, Mike Sanders, Shark Boy, and Kaz Hayashi was there, although I think Kaz went back to Japan uh, and did not want to stick around. But right. Alan told me a story about one particular day where they were calling people into the office and one by one, people were being told that they were being let go. And he specifically mentioned that he, Skipper walked out with tears in his eyes. Uh, all of you guys, again, as I said, being in one of the two major companies at the height of wrestling, 
that is such a special thing for you all to say that you're a part of. Even if it was 2000 and everyone wants to talk crap about 2000 WCW and 2001 WCW, they still garnered higher ratings on average than what Raw and SmackDown are doing today. And, right. um, and so this is an important thing. You guys now go into this position here and then one by one, it seems like most of the guys are being told that they're being let go. Were you a part of this? And, 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 and is this how it came about for you as well? Yeah, let me put it in perspective for you a little bit even deeper than that, too. If, uh, if you got upset with Alan, then, then you'll probably get upset about this. Um, Alan and I were pretty close because, again, we go back to those power plant roots that we were talking about. I was I was the drill sergeant. You know, roles got to be reversed once you made it a power plant. Instead of you being the person on the receiving end of that drill sergeant treatment, you got to be the drill sergeant on the next <laughs> through. Yeah. So I remember Allen's trial and, uh, and Elix Skippers, for that matter, and those guys. And, and so there's a lot of water under the bridge at that point. And to put it in perspective, when we first get to Cincinnati, this is how temporary we think this is going to be. We found an extended stay hotel that gave us a pretty good weekly rate. So me, Jamie Noble, Alan Funk, and Rick Cornell, Reno, we're sharing a two-bedroom, not two-bedroom, sorry, let me rephrase that because there's a big difference between having two bedrooms and just having two beds. We were sharing a double hotel room. That's what we were sharing to try to save money. So four guys in a one-bedroom, uh, one-room hotel room with, with two beds in it just to try to live and, and, and save money, have a little kitchenette in it. We'd watch movies together on TV, and uh, we wore out at George Foreman Grill, man. It was all steaks yeah. and George Foreman. <laughs> and constantly. Alan Funk would buy just these flats of eggs. He ate eggs constantly, constantly. <laughs> but we all got along great. So so from, a, from us jiving with each other and living together wasn't the problem at all. But keep in mind, we accomplished at that point. We had proven our dress at that point. Here we are relegated to, to taking turns sleeping on the floor and rotating. Some people get the bed, some people get the floor, depending on the day of the week. And we're television wrestling stars. While meanwhile, WWE has also started this show called Tough Enough, where they got yeah. these guys that have never done anything staying in a mansion and being followed by cameras. So that was kind of hard for us to swallow. Now, I don't blame them because it's television and you're making money and you're, you're putting together a TV show. So it's all fair game. I'm not saying that from a business standpoint, they're doing the right thing. From a personal standpoint, you can understand why some guys that had worked as hard as we had worked felt extremely slighted. Yeah. We felt extremely slighted. And we felt like we were being walked all over, man. And, and again, that would be bad enough if this lasted a week. It'd be bad enough if it lasted a month. But to be there for nine months and week in and week out with no kind of understanding of when the end inside is going to be, no direction, nobody really encouraging you, um, no kind of plan whatsoever. And then finally, I was starting to see the writing on the wall a little bit and they would get a little bit more strict, a little bit more strict. And, and I'll be honest with you, I've always been an optimist. I've always been the guy that you want around because I bring the energy and I bring the fun and I don't let anything bother me and everything's water off the duck's back because I've experienced everything in my life and you're not going to beat me down. My attitude changed up there. I had a bad attitude and I could kind of see the writing on the wall because I knew they probably weren't going to keep me around when I'm acting like somebody that doesn't want to be there. I, I, I can that now. I didn't understand that then. And that day that I was talking about, they took us in the rooms individually and met with us individually. And when I went there and I sat down and it was John Laurinaitis, uh, I think Bob Clark may have been there, which was just an office guy at the time, a couple other guys, and Dr. Tom Pritchard was there. And I remember them telling me that, uh, you know, Vince uh, wasn't going to choose to do this anymore with me right now. You know, there was the old – Good luck in future endeavor type Maybe we want to bring it back in a little while, but now uh, they didn't really have anything for me. And Dr. Tom Pritchard, to his credit, and I still see Tom a pretty good bit, at least once a year, if not more often. Oh, we spent a little time together. Uh, he spoke up for me. He said, I just want to, I'm going to go on record for what it's worth. 
say, I think you're making a mistake here with Lash. I don't think that you would best – he's a talented guy. He's not somebody you want to lose. Just want to say that. And he didn't get anything out of saying that. And he wasn't going to stop it from happening. But he still did it because he felt like it was the right thing to do. And that always meant a lot to me. That always meant a great deal to me. And, you know, everything was always couched in, well, where are you going to go and make this kind of money? And uh, you should be happy that you're doing this and that you're getting paid to train. And my mentality was this. And I told him this. I said, look. I grew up dirt poor in Alabama, digging ditches. Man, I'll go back and dig ditches before you're going to hold money over my head. I had more pride than that. And I could kind of see the writing on the wall. When they're trying to quote, quote, fire me like they were trying to fire everybody else. What I knew and kind of realized in the moment that they didn't know was I had a different contract than everybody else. Right. Most of those guys up there had trainee contracts, which means – it could let you go every 90 days with no ifs, ands, or buts about it, no excuses. They just say, hey, we don't choose to do business with you anymore. I had a three-year guaranteed deal right? because I took such a huge pay cut and because of what I was walking away with w from WCW money in order to go to WWE. And I knew that in the back of my mind, but I also knew there's no future here. What am I going to – there was nothing there for me to fight for. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I just said, what I'll do is they want to fire me. I'll let them fire me and I'll go home and um, I'll wait on them to contact me. And we'll see how this works out because legally they're just not going to be able to do it. But um, I'll go home and let the dust settle and then we'll figure it out because I want to get out of here right now. And I left like everybody else left. We all kind of went home that weekend. Um, I can remember talking to Johnny and them. Uh, Johnny, I think, called me a couple of weeks later or so in Nashville. And he said, Lash, we messed up. And I said, well, I know, Johnny, what we're going to do about now. And he goes, well, you know, you really can't come back right now. There's, there's, you know, now's not the time to really come back. And I said, yeah, I get that. I get that. I'm not making you guys any money. You're not making me the money that you promised me. But I do have a guaranteed deal. And he goes, well, you know, legal department's talking about how they can use this clause about you not being in shape and everything else. And I go, whoa, 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 let's just stop right there for a second. Let, let's not go down that road because, look, I, I may not be the body on the, on, on the roster, but at the same time, I'm not going to be the fattest guy either. And we don't want to go around counting fat percentages just to somebody get it, try to get out of the contract. I said, let's just try to do something that's fair. I said, if I had – I said, I'm not trying to burn any bridges. I'm not trying to hold Vince up for money. He owes me another two and a half years. I don't expect him to pay me for another two and a half years. I don't. I'm not going to sit here and be that guy. I'm just, that's not my style. I said, if you were just firing me straight out, I would have, uh, I would have what, 90 days pay? I said, instead of 90 days pay, how about you give me 180 days pay? I said, instead of three months, give me six months. So I'm figure out what I want to do with my life. And that way I'm not burning any bridges. And then I, maybe I'd come back later. Who knows? And they tried to get me to go to Puerto Rico. I wasn't interested in going to Puerto Rico at the time. Um, I was like, man, they killed Brody. I don't have a shot. But, <laughs> no, but uh, in, all, in all honesty, though, I just I just didn't feel like that was the, the route that I needed to go. And, Not fair uh, enough. I bounced around. But, you know, and, you know, it just – it was it's sad looking back because I think that that – that beat the passion out of a lot of very talented wrestlers. Yeah. I completely I think understand. that's the best. Yeah, if because you had a whole generation. I'm sorry. I was just a whole generation of wrestlers that went through that experience that never became quite what they could have become because of that particular experience. Absolutely. And uh, all I wanted to say was, you know, like, uh, Alan didn't wrestle for much longer. He did a little bit in TNA, but then he was done. I, uh, Elix Skipper did a little bit in TNA as well. Uh, Reno, I think, completely left the business after that. Rick Cornell, uh, uh, Shark Boy ended up going to TNA, which was good for him. Kaz went back to Japan. Mike Sanders, a little bit in TNA, but nothing else much after that. And of course, Easy Money, Jason Jed. I don't think he uh, did too much more after that either. So, it, it, it's it, it rings true it rings true what you've just said that it that that killed uh motivation and uh i guess inspiration for guys that really had something at some stage and 
and now that was gone for a whole bunch of them because of this bad experience. But um, thank you for sharing all that. Um, you, so did you get the 180 days and, and what did you think to yourself during those 180 days about what you wanted to do? Did you want to sink your teeth into the cartoonist stuff a lot more? How did that go about? No, because at that moment I was still in a daze, man. And, and I've, to be honest with you, the, the finality there in WWE was we came to that agreement and that was no problem whatsoever. I, I agreed to sign my release to them. Uh, in exchange for, you know, 180 days pay, I think, or whatever it was. I think that's about what it was. And it was nominal for them. It wasn't a big deal to them. And, and they made it go away. And it wasn't a big deal, uh, you know, and, and, and nobody had hurt feelings over it, by the way. Um, I mean, I didn't realize it at the time how much it affected me emotionally. I was maybe three or four years down the line, and I read a book later on. Um, and I read this book that opened my eyes and made me realize something that I've only been able to talk about within the last couple of years, because it's that fresh to me, this perspective that I have on that era. And, and what it is, there are certain jobs in this world that are not jobs, they're lifestyles. And what I mean by that is if you're special forces in the military, that's not an occupation you call a lifestyle. A doctor, that's you're punching a clock on that's a lifestyle you know that's your identity that's who you are and wrestling is one of those types of occupations you know that that is that is who you are it's an identity and when you lose a job like that when you lose a job like that you've lost your identity almost to the point of what they equated it to was like having a a a loss in your family somebody passing away that's close to you you go through this depression and you go through this difficulty and this sense of loss without even realizing it. So I went through this period of depression that I didn't even realize I was going through at the time, man. I just thought, I thought this sucks. But, you know, beyond that, I didn't see it for what it was. And I kept trying to push forward thinking I could still be who I was. And there was really no place to go to. So that didn't help either. There's so much uncertainty in the wrestling business and in the landscape, because if you weren't wrestling for Vince, you really weren't making any money. And I was growing bitter and resentful by the day without even realizing that I was bitter and resentful because I was a happy go lucky, hi to everybody type mentality. And I didn't, I mean, I started to get nagging injuries. I had all these concussions that were really affecting me. Uh, by that point, I started gaining weight. I had a compression fracture in my lower back, two herniated discs, a ruptured disc. And I would start, I realized one day I was doing independence, man. And I had this gimmick belt that I'd wear to different independent shows that I called the Cajun weight title. And <laughs> If, if I was a baby face, then I'd use that as a great prop. And you get your picture taken with the Cajun weight title. It's got my face on it, the whole deal. And if I was a heel, then, you know, I'd let you beat the Cajun weight title. And then I'd immediately uh, take back on the guys that you're not qualified to be the Cajun weight champion if you're not Cajun. So you <laughs> have to surrender the belt back. So there's kind of a little heat signal. But I, wore, I would wear this belt, and I realized I was starting to wear it to cover up my waist and to cover up my gut. And so I put this belt on, so it's just kind of hanging off of me, and I'd <laughs> stick my water in it like it's a cup holder, right? And like it's a holster. And that, that's how easy I was getting. And, and when I realized I was getting that lazy, I lost my passion for the business at that point. I thought, it's time to hang up. And I did a show in Alabama um, at a high school. And the guy that I was wrestling in the main event was a good friend of mine, uh, Bull Buchanan from, from WWE, the old WWF days. I knew I could have a great match with him. And um, I, walked in the, I walked in the back and I saw that I'm wrestling him in the main event. And I said, Barry, this is my, this is my retirement match. It's my last match. Wow. Yeah, and he goes, he goes, oh, stop, man. I go, no, 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 we'll have a good match. Let's go out there and have a good match. But, and I said, I'm done after that. So we go into the ring. We have a match. I get through having a match, great match. I didn't cut a promo. I didn't make a big deal out of it. I rolled out of the ring, and I haven't rolled back into a ring since. And my mentality was that when I said I was done, I was done. And uh, I, I didn't believe in the keep going back. And, of course, this is the wrestling business. You never say never. And, and in some ways, I'm still young by wrestling standards. And I'm in better shape now than I've been in 15 years. But, you know, I walked out and I never walked back. And it's funny. A funny addendum to that story is, uh, the first time I'd even walked into a wrestling ring 
since then. And this wasn't a wrestling show. They just happened to have a ring set up. They did a event about a year and a half in my uh, about a year and a half ago in my hometown here in Alabama, and they inducted uh, Arn Anderson into the Alabama Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame. And so, since Arn was going to be in town and he was going to be at that show, they asked him to put on a clinic during the day. And Bull has a son that's getting into the wrestling business. A very talented guy, big kid, man, raw bone, most talented guy they had there for sure. And he brought him to that clinic because he wanted to learn, you know, from, from Arn, take advantage of Arn being there. And I knew the guy we're putting on the show. I see him in the gym all the time working out, great guys. And I asked him, I said, I don't want to come to the show because I don't want fans to start talking and thinking that I'm coming back to the wrestling business. You know, I don't think I don't Twitter and everything else. I said, so I don't want to make a spectacle at the show today just to see Arn. I had seen him since WCW days. Was a tremendous aid helped me a great deal. He was wonderful to me during my career. I just want to shake his hand and thank him. Said, yeah, of course, you're welcome to anything we're doing anytime, man. So I went to see Arn and to shake his hand and to thank him for all that he did for me. And saw Bull there because he brought his son. And of course, he sees me. He goes, "Well," and he hugs me. And of course, I come up to about his chest like a little kid. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, man, I haven't seen you in about 10 years. Where you been? I said, I told you I was retiring that night. I said, I thought you were ribbing me. I said, well, that'd been a heck of a rib. <laughs> That's fantastic, Barry. Yeah. So wow, that was, so that I didn't, my... wow, I didn't realize that Bull Buchanan was your final match. Uh, from my uh, research, it says something different, but let's not worry about that because sometimes the internet can be wrong. But um I've got like just a couple more questions and I just wanted to quickly sift into uh, 19th of June, 2002, TNA, the first episode of TNA, the gauntlet for the gold, Lash LaRue was a part of it. Uh, why were you not brought back after this? Please tell me. Uh, my, my gut feeling, if you want to know the truth, I was never supposed to be a part of it in the first place. And oh. so the reason probably not brought back was I was probably because I was fat and out of shape at that point. <laughs> and that I'm just being, I'm being, I'm being honest with myself. I didn't think so at the time, man, but I was again off of all that bitterness and, and not realizing that I was bitter at the time, not realizing that I wasn't training at the time, not realizing that I wasn't at my best. You know, sometimes we can have blinders when it comes to that. If we're dealing with some emotional issues and, and some difficulties in our life. And that certainly was true for me. And I was sitting at home, not doing anything at all. And I had a conversation with Ed Ferreira, who was involved in that at the time. And, and Ed, I don't remember if Ed called me or if I called Ed. And it was not for any reason other than just to talk and to say hi. You know, just two, two guys that were buddies in WCW that missed each other. And, and Ed said, we're doing this gauntlet for the goal. Would you be willing to do it? And he told me how much they could pay me to do it. I, I was I was pleased that somebody was asking me to do something, <laughs> to be honest with you. And I said, sure, absolutely. I'd love to be a part of it, man. And that's how I became a part of it, very small piece. And after that, um, I really didn't hear anything back from them, and I didn't pursue anything. In a few months, I don't really remember the timeline, but uh, there was a time there when I started going back up there to Nashville every week with the mentality sort of what I had when I told you uh, starting back in Orlando, you know, when you just show up at the TV takings with you and say, I'm here. And I started trying to do that a little bit in TNA, um, trying to find my roots again when it became obvious to me that if I, I'm just sitting at home and nobody's going to call me. You know, and, and that's that was the hard part of the wrestling business for me personally. I hate trying to sell myself. It's the same way with my art business now. The, 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 the events that I love doing is when they call me and ask me if I'm available. They know what the set rate is. I go and I show up and I draw and a week later a check comes in the mail. I don't want to have to haggle over money. I don't want to have to see the promoter afterwards. I don't want to have to keep talking to you about it. I want to have to try to convince you of what my worth is. That kind of stuff bothered me, and that kept me from really pushing myself and trying to get myself booked more. And instead, I just kind of sat at home waiting on people to call me and try to book me, and that's no way to do business on that level. And I started trying to show up at TA, and nothing really came out of that. Uh, I wished that it had. I kind of thought it might be a fit for me at the time, 
But again, I don't think that I was mentally and emotionally where I needed to be in order to be successful. Okay. And for those playing at home, uh, the matches later on that you would have in TNA were on TNA Explosion against Chris Harris, Sabu, which is an incredible uh, thought process right there that uh, Lash LaRue and Sabu <laughs> would clash in the mid-2000s there. And, uh, of course, you teamed with Ray Gordy uh, against Eric Young and Johnny Devine in the last time that you wrestled for TNA, who, believe it or not, were known as Team Canada at the time, which is, a, I guess, a throwback uh, in a way to WCW, but uh, just throwing that out there that um that those the, were the matches that did happen at that time. Um, okay, so you've you've mentioned about your retirement match. You've mentioned about why you decided to leave the wrestling business. Bull Buchanan was the final match. Um, two more questions before I get to my segment five second frenzy. Lash Larue. First one is: Do you have any particular regrets? Any regrets? Um, I don't have any regrets. Um, and, and I say that because I think I always tried to make the most out of what I had offered in front of me at that particular time with what I, the tools that I had in the toolbox, so to speak. Um, it's easy to look back and say, I wish I had done more with this, uh, this opportunity and I wish I'd had done more with that opportunity. But what that, man, you do that till the cows come home in life, you know, and, and it never really accomplishes much. I never had a situation in my wrestling career where I felt like I did the wrong thing, you know? So any regrets I have was just be wishing that I had been wiser at a particular point to make the most out of a certain opportunity. But no, 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 I don't, I don't, I never did anything that I wish that I hadn't done. Awesome, bro. That's one thing that I love hearing the most is that someone does not have any regret, regrets from their time in the wrestling business. Um, okay, Lash, last question before I get to Five Second Frenzy. Do you have anything in your life that you would like to plug or anything that you would like to say to your fans out there that miss you and, and want to know how you're doing in life? Please plug anything that you want to, whether it's with the cartoonist cartoonist stuff anything you want oh uh, well let's see uh, I, I have a pretty laid-back life now and um i'll give you a really quick bio thumbnail sketch of where last year in 2021 because i'm a complete ghost on social media people don't find me on twitter they don't find me on on uh you know this all too well no facebook <laughs> no instagram none of that stuff and and I've just kind of have been a shadow and I've enjoyed kind of flying under the radar because of that. At the same time, I don't make myself completely inaccessible either. Um, I'm fully cool with people having my email address. My email is slash WCW at AOL.com because yes, I still had that exact same uh, email address that I had way back. And if you pull out some of those magazines where I did my lashing out cartoons and I think I have my email address on those yeah. cartoons and <laughs> Anybody wants to contact me about anything like that, they're more than welcome to. I don't know how many listeners or viewers you may have that are in an area that would want to book me out to do caricature events, but I primarily make my income now doing uh, caricature events. Basically, what that means if you've ever been to a carnival or been to a theme park where they have the booth set up, the, the really, really quick, exaggerated cartoon portraits of people and caricatures. That's what I do, man. That's what I specialize in. So people will book me out for wedding receptions. They book me out for uh, corporate parties, for Christmas parties, fall festivals. I do a lot of college campuses. I do a lot of high schools, and they just pay me per hour. I show up, put my easel up. I draw people, interact with them. And sometimes I get booked just to do cartoons, and they don't have a clue who I am. Then sometimes I get booked because they know exactly who I am and they want to hear me tell the same story while I'm drawing their guests. I'm okay either way. The rate's the same regardless. So <laughs> if there's anybody around the Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee area that want to book me for that, they're certainly welcome to email me and I can give them details on that. Um, I have a few videos up on YouTube, nothing with phenomenal views or anything like that, where I draw some other wrestlers just for fun. Um, also, I do a lot of commission caricatures. So what that means is if you're somebody who does not live 
uh, in my service area, for lack of a better way of putting it, when it comes to doing live events, you can email me and I can do a uh, commission caricature for you. And I can give you the rates on that if you if you email me. And I do full color caricature poster style and have it printed 20 by 30 and have it shipped to you. Uh, so it's full color, it's digital. I can send you the digital file as well. And you can put it up on your social media. You can have a lot of fun with it. And you have an original drawing by Lash LaRue. <laughs> so that's where, I, that's where I make my primary primary income. Outside of that, I'm also a, a pastor now. I'm the associate pastor of the Anderson First Baptist Church in McClellan here in my hometown. I'm also a chaplain at uh, Legacy Village, which is an assisted living facility in town. So I do a lot of ministry work as well. And here's an exclusive for you and your viewers. Um, those that may follow uh, Twitter in Super 70 Sports, I'm about to work into a uh, partnership with Super 70 Sports where I'll be providing some artwork for them going forward. So that's pretty exciting because they have quite a following. Awesome, man. Can you just mention that name of, of that company again one more time? Super City Sports. They were listed as one of the top uh, 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 Twitter handles to follow in uh, Sports Illustrated, I think, last year or the year before. They have over a half a million followers. They're just phenomenal. Uh, it's a great, very funny guy. That he's a fan of all sports, but he's also an old school wrestling fan. And he will find some of the most phenomenal pictures from like the 70s and 80s of professional wrestling and just make some kind of sarcastic, snarky comment and post it like a meme almost in, in a twit in a, a Twitter format. And people just go crazy over it. it looks, it's, it's hilarious. It's funny. Awesome. We'll make sure that that is in the description below on YouTube. When people are watching this interview, we're going to have all of that plugged in there. So for anyone that wants to check out what Lash has just been plugging, please do. And you know what? I probably am going to uh, indulge myself in getting a caricature made as well, I think. I think, that, I think that'll be awesome. Okay, Lash, it's time for Five Second Frenzy. Five Second Frenzy is a segment that we have where... We just ask you a bunch of quick fire questions. There's a, three about wrestling, but the rest are about other things in life. Are you ready, Lash the Root? I am always ready. All right, baby, let's do this. First and foremost, Lash the Root, who is your favorite wrestler of all time? Favorite wrestler of all time. Now, now it has to be Ric Flair just because of longevity and what he was able to accomplish over a course of a career. If you had asked me when I was a kid, then Hulk Hogan was the guy that was my guy. That's what I grew up watching. That's what drew me into loving wrestling in the first place. And, and Ric Flair was always the bad guy when I was a kid. So it was difficult for me to cheer him on. Once I became a wrestler and could appreciate his entire body of work, that's when I became a bigger Ric Flair fan. I totally get where you come from. And look, you got to share a locker room with both of them. So that's a point right. to Lash LaRue. Favorite opponent over your course of your wrestling career? Probably Ray Mysterio Jr. Uh, we always had great charisma and uh, uh, great chemistry together. And the reason why I say that I think he was favorite uh, is close between Ray and Disco and for different reasons. Disco and I, I think we had some of the more entertaining wrestling matches and we had great chemistry together. Uh, but Ray Mysterio had this unspoken chemistry. We could do things in the ring that were not actual moves. We were making it up on the fly, these transitions and going from one uh, place to the next. And oftentimes, not even say a word between us. We just kind of could feel what the other person was doing. Absolutely, bro. They were some great matches any time I did see it. Uh, speaking of matches, what was your favorite match you ever had in your career? It is a, uh, is a tie between the two that we really probably spent the most time talking about, which is uh, the Billy Kidman uh, debut, Nitro debut there in Minneapolis for the Cruiserweight title, and then also – the other match for the Cruiserweight title, that pay-per-view at Halloween Havoc against Disco Inferno. Awesome. I was, I was expecting that to be the answer. Um, but good to have both of them because they're both equally as important. Okay. 
Getting away from wrestling, finally. Gosh, it always has to be about wrestling, doesn't it, Lash? Uh, but no, now, okay, let, let's let's get away wrong. from it. <laughs> 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 what is your favorite book? My favorite book, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. If you're talking about novels, if you're talking about nonfiction, then the Bible. Obviously, I do a lot of studying and a lot of uh, preaching and teaching out of that. But just for fun, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is hard to beat. Excellent, excellent. And of course, our good friend of the show, Nikita Koloff's favorite book was the Bible as well. Um, oh, okay. side note, quickly, not to interrupt you, but sure. a little side note, hypothetical trivia that nobody would know. Nikita wrote a book once that I illustrated for him. Really? Wow. That's yeah. Awesome. Love Nikita. He's such a great guy. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Lash, the next one, your favorite TV show. Oh, man, let's see. That, that's a tough one because that changes depending on the mood that I'm in. And I don't watch as much TV as I used to watch anymore. Um, I watch on a regular basis. I like the Goldbergs. I like the Goldbergs a lot. Yeah. Was there ever a TV show that you liked as a kid? Man, as a kid, I loved the Dukes of Hazard. Without question, I was just that was like the greatest in the world. A little redneck country boy from Alabama, me and my brothers would watch the Dukes of Hazard, and we would always go out and lock the doors on my mom's car, but make sure the windows were rolled down so we felt like we were obligated to get through the windows. <laughs> uh, the next one, I guess, is also a tough one. A, a lot of people have a hard time with this one. Favorite film? Oh, uh, Godfather. Godfather. It probably be really close between the Godfather and Rocky, but the Godfather is kind of hard to, to beat. Very good. Great selection there. I'm Italian, so I like that. Uh, favorite musical artist, Lash? Mm, Elvis Presley. Love it. Love it. Love it. When, uh, when, when the first COVID lockdown took place in our city, I would drive through the suburbs in my little red car with the windows down, blaring Elvis Presley. There were people walking down, exercising with their masks on, and they would, like, just hear, hear my car blaring Elvis Presley, and they would, like, really appreciate it. So I dig a bit of Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, favorite food? Ah, favorite food, steak. Goodbye steak, without question. Uh, that's absolutely my favorite. A real ribeye steak that is grilled well, Mm, man, mm. Now, I don't mean well, I just mean someone does a good job grilling it. I like it medium. Yeah, me too. And, and and that's my favorite. And most wrestlers on the show either say steak or pizza. So you're you're part of that that crew right there. Favorite place to eat on the road? Waffle House. We get that a lot too. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, awful, he's a house. And the reason why you get that is because. You find out as a wrestler really quick that your options are limited after a show, and you could always count on the Waffle House to, to cook things up the way that you would ask, and you could eat relatively clean. You know, have them steam the hash browns, uh, either have a steak or have the ch chicken breast grilled, and, uh, you know, you could eat relatively clean. Yeah, we always get that, or Denny's, or uh, crack a Barrel. Um, but I bet you this. I bet you do not get this, Carl. When you go to Waffle House, you always have to drop a quarter in the jukebox because most people don't know that Waffle House has their own selection of in-house songs that were written specifically for Waffle House. And my favorite one is, you put one in, it's special lady waiting on me at the Waffle House. <laughs> great, That's great awesome, bro. <laughs> Unfortunately, we do not have Waffle House here in Australia, but one day when I'm over there, I hope to indulge. Uh, <laughs> I apologize on behalf of the United States of America. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Okay, the next one, I look, I, I have a feeling that you might not be able to answer this one. Your favorite alcoholic beverage, I feel like you might not be someone that drinks. I, I don't drink on a regular basis, but if you're just talking about, hey, I'm going to take a little taste of something, uh, Jack Daniels whiskey straight. Wonderful, wonderful, and a very good choice. Okay, Lash, the second last one here for Five Second Frenzy. It is the naughtiest one of Five Second Frenzy, but your favorite female body part. What is something about a female, a woman, that you like to look at 
first. I like Nikita Koloff's answer. He said he likes the shape of a woman. I like that one. I think that's classy. But what is your what is your go to female body part? Eyes. If a woman can't look you in the eyes, then you have to question what kind of relationship you could ever have with her. <laughs> that is a great answer, bro. I love the eyes too. That's what made me fall in love with my partner was her eyes. And I'll tell you this story. I'm telling a story finally. When the WWE came to Perth, I don't know what year it was, maybe 2006 or something like that. Tori Wilson was, was my crush growing up and we were in the hotel me and my friends us like four nerdy skinny friends whose metabolism was incredible at the time now not so much but i was a skinny nerd with pimples in his face and tori was walking from the hotel they were heading to the show they were signing autographs and as she was signing an autograph for me i said thanks tori and she looked up and our eyes clashed like this and i melted <laughs> absolutely does it every time <laughs> <laughs> anyway the last one lash the you might not be able to answer this one either because i don't think you've sworn once on this show but what is your favorite curse word oh man uh let's see mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't have a curse word, I don't think. And, and I'll tell you the reason why. I'm not trying to, to, to beg off or, or, or to make excuses for it. Uh, early on in my career, Jody Hamilton, who ran the old WCW power plant, who was a phenomenal mind for the business, and don't misunderstand me, outside of the, of the wrestling business, or outside of the ring, rather, he could cuss with the best of them. He could certainly <laughs> do it. But... He never liked anybody cussing on the microphone when they're uh, cutting a promo. And the reason why he said that if you were cussing while you were cutting a promo, then it was probably because you weren't creative enough to come up with something different to say. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm big on profanity is not just because of my faith or my beliefs, also just because I always try to be more creative than that and more articulate than that. And I like it far when you can come up with something like Mother or something like that, or, you know, you know, anything like that that you could throw out there that somebody's not expecting to hear, then to me, that's always far more entertaining than just the same old cuss word that everybody hears. <laughs> Fair enough. But say Lash LaRue is walking through the house and you don't have any shoes on and you accidentally kick the leg of a table really hard and you hurt your toes real badly. Yeah. What would you yell yeah. out? Would you say, like, can sonnet or <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I, I got nothing on that one. <laughs> That's fine. I got <laughs> well, Lash, I really want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, we, we've we've spoke a long time now, but I think just the flow of the conversation just it, it just went so well and. I just want to say I live in the most isolated city in the world, Perth, Western Australia. And for you to reach that far in your wrestling career, to have me be a fan of you means that there are many fans so far and so wide here in the world that appreciated you and what you've done in the wrestling business. You said earlier that I'm no legend. No, no. I disagree. You are a legend of the wrestling business. You are one of those very few that were in one of the two top companies at the height of wrestling on TV, on pay-per-view. You did it, man. Like that is so huge for somebody to say that they did. So I hope when you look back on your career that you are so proud of what you accomplished because you were there right there and it means the world, bro. Hey, well, Carl, you are a gentleman and a scholar, and you were kind and generous to say those things. And I, I take them to heart simply because um, I, I know they come from a place of sincerity. And I'm fortunate enough to, to run into two fans on a regular basis that show that kind of uh, that, that kind of duration.
my career, and it means a great deal to me. I never take it for granted. I never take it lightly. And I, I do recognize that having that experience is a little bit of rare air that not everybody gets to be a part of. And, and I'm thankful for that. I'm grateful for that. And I love the fact that you never know what the rest of life is going to bring out of you. Life brings these surprises to us. It has these twists and turns. It has these ups and these downs and these triumphs and these tragedies. Man, and you never know what's around the corner. And, you know, for all the wrestling fans that are listening to this and the people that do have an appreciation for Lash LaRue's career, you know, I consider myself 100% indefinitely retired, but I'm I'm 44 years old. You know, that's not extremely old by wrestling standards. I started at a very young age. So, you know, you you never say never in this business. And you never know what life's going to bring back around especially when you have companies like AEW out there and Impact out there and you see the wrestling landscape shifting a little bit and you see options on the table and you think, well, for the first time in a long time, there are things going on in the wrestling business that you can get excited about, that you can get excited about. And I'm not knocking WWE's product either. I think that it's changed a lot and evolved a good bit too. And uh, I love the fact that there are just options out there. You know, for a long time, I was not – extremely excited about what was going on in the wrestling business and really did not consider myself a wrestling fan because the landscape had changed to such an extreme that it, I couldn't connect with it. You know, for the first time in a long time, I could feel myself beginning to connect with it. again. That's cool, man. And, uh, you know, there are options out there. So, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing uh, Lashler out there uh, one day. But uh... you, never know. you never say never. I got a lot of bumps left in me. <laughs> awesome bro thank you again for talking to me tonight my friend and and I, I i always knew that when we would have this conversation that it was going to be something special and i think this is the ultimate lash larue interview and i feel like from here on you and i are going to be friends oh absolutely no question at all man you've been extremely kind to me and i can't thank you enough for all this pleasure, my friend. thank you lash Appreciate you so much. And everyone out there, thank you so much for checking out my interview here on the Insider's Edge podcast with the one and only Raging Cajun, Lash LaRue. And really, honestly, appreciate your time. Appreciate you guys caring about the show. It's firing on all cylinders. And we will see you again next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>